Ten. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> almost 60. <laughs> yeah, almost. We have passed. <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah, almost. Yeah. Inshallah. Uh, Dr. Azam is working every day with uh, Dr. Ungaran. <laughs> I have this working pack. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, it's 2.15. Shall we uh, begin, Prof. Akna? Yeah, inshallah. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, so the recording will start, yeah? Inshallah. Uh, Brother Shafiullah, the recording. Brother Ikram, the recording should start uh, now. Okay, Doctor, we are already on. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma aftah alayna hikmataka wa anshur alayna min khazaini rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Professor Dr. Akmal Huzairi bin Abdurrahman, Director of Centris. Associate Professor Dr. Nazra Ahmad, Deputy Director of Centris Islamization Office. Honorable panel members, Professor Dr. Sulaiman Daris, Professor Dr. Walid Fakri Faris, Ustaz Datuk Hamidun Abdul Hamid, Associate Professor Dr. Wan Azam Muhammad Amin, Professors, Doctors, Brothers and Sisters, Centris Admin, wherever you may be in Malaysia or elsewhere, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome to Centris Virtual Forum. Uh, series number 5, 2021-2022, uh, with the theme Humanizing Education for Rahmatan Lil Alameen, Islamic Spirituality, Sufism, and Scientific Proliferation. I am Dr. Nurjana from Centris, your moderator for today. To gain barakah on this blessed day, Tuesday, 21st June 2022, 17th Dhul 1443, let us all begin with the recitation of Al-Fatiha. Um, we are supposed to have Brother Saiful Akmal with us. Uh, Brother Saiful Akmal, are you online? Um, if not, then we will just have to uh, be settled with the Al Fatiha. Perhaps, Prof Akmal, you would like to read a short dua to mark the start of the program? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. والصلاه والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اللهم احسن عاقبتنا في الامور كلها واجرنا من خزي الدنيا وعذاب الاخره اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا من خزائن رحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا من بعد تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا شقيا ولا محروما اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ولوالدينا وارحمهم كما ربونا صغارا ولجميع المسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الاحياء منهم والاموات ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين 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 يا رب العالمين أم Education has always been the bedrock of humanity as it lays down the architecture of the future. Unfortunately, with the excessive focus on industrialization, education has lost its soul and its right bearings. The IIUM maintains that education or the propagation and advancement of knowledge is an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that must conform to the purpose of his creation of the universe. Education is to nurture the person as Allah's servant Amt, and his khalifa or trustee on earth and to function in accordance to his will where the quest of knowledge is considered as an act of ibadah. Unlike the humanism of secularism, the humanism that is referred to here is the humanism of Islam, insaniyat al-Islam, with a conscious emphasis on ruhiyah or spirituality. 
the usage of the term rahmatan lil alamin must be based on the objectives of the sharia because the content of a sharia is a manifestation of allah's rahmah to all the worlds and where al amru bil ma'ruf and al uh, nahi anil munkar are manifestations of rahmatan lil alamin it is clear then that in our context humanization at uh, humanizing education for rahmatan lil alamin requires a great deal of attention to spirituality which refers to matters pertaining to the existence of man and nature in relation to the creator this fundamental core of humanity has long been sidelined to the detriment of mankind and consequently to his environment and civilization. On the contrary, history testifies to the heritage of Islamic spirituality, which was very much the center or even the lesson that for the proliferation of knowledge and sciences or alum in Islamic civilization. Today's forum addresses Islamic spirituality, Sufism and scientific proliferation from four essential areas Namely, first, Islamic spirituality, Sufism and intellectual disciplines of Muslim scholars of the past. Second, uh, Sufism and scientific proliferation, a potent complementarity of the Islamic eras. Third, spiritual education, spiritual discipline and scientific endeavors, lessons from our heritage. And the last, fourth, relevantizing Islamic spirituality in the wake of the fourth and fifth industrial revolutions, uh, looking for practical approach. We will now listen to the director of Centris, Professor Dr. Akmal Khuzairi with his welcoming remark. Welcome, Prof. Um, thank you, Dr. Nurjanna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh to all our uh, panelists this afternoon and also to those who are participating in this channel and uh, elsewhere uh, on YouTube. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'a wa lah rabbi shali sadri wa yasalli amri wa halal aqnata min lisani yabka wa qawli. Again, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Jannah, um, for us at Santry is having such a uh, program. It's also a part of our learning curve uh, because at Santry we are always uh, being approached um, by our fellow academics at the university uh, on certain issues, of course. And uh, it is our responsibility to uh, look into these issues uh, from uh, the Islamic perspective. As the name of the center itself speaks for itself, it is a center for Islamization. Uh, hence, uh, this virtual program of which this is the fifth series of what we have been organizing before this, uh, trying to tackle the uh, primary agendas of IAUM, the university. And um, we have been chanting the slogan of humanizing education. And um, there have been discourses, of course, talks, uh, and also seminars to look into how to link uh, the agenda of humanizing education and also with the aspects of uh, the Islamic tradition. Uh, and inshallah, today uh, we'll be focusing on the aspect of spirituality, uh, Sufism. Uh, these metaphysical aspects of Islam uh, need to be linked with um, education in general, uh, but also how is it possible for us to look from the perspective of humanizing education and what can these aspects, these metaphysical aspects play <clears throat> the role in order to enrich um, or to open more doors um, uh, to some other discussions so that we can also share uh, these contents with our fellow academics later on. So the purpose of having this seminar and by gathering uh, this um, uh, awesome uh, intellectuals with us this afternoon uh, is actually to set the stage uh, for further discussion and to provide, especially uh, we at Centris, with some inputs on how, if we are posed the question of uh, uh, the linkages, uh, the uh, relationships between spirituality and also the agenda of humanizing education. So that is why that we have uh, identified 
these four esteemed speakers with us this afternoon. Uh, each um, will be dealing with a topic uh, from certain perspective. We have four perspective and uh, we made it our objectives of the program. Uh, we want to explore the metaphysical aspect of Islam and its alignment with the agenda of humanizing education. And uh, we want to identify how this metaphysical aspect played its role before and uh, what that uh, it contributed. So perhaps that there are lessons that can be drawn and uh, reapplied in the modern context of which this perspective, inshallah, will be uh, thoroughly discussed by Prof. Walid. <clears throat> uh, we want to learn uh, from the tradition on how to synergize between uh, the uh, physical disciplines and the metaphysical. This perspective, inshallah, will be uh, discussed by Dr. Hamidun and uh, uh, Prof. Dr. Sulaiman Derin, our colleague from Turkey, uh, uh, Hosh Geldin, Prof. Uh, Kurler, uh, on your willingness to participate and uh, also uh, 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 make the discussion uh, merrier, inshallah. Uh, Prof. Sulaiman will be uh, trying to look from the angle of identifying the role of spirituality uh, and how can we link that with uh, the civilizational development? So I think uh, what we are trying when we're trying to approach the issue of humanizing education, uh, these are the four aspects of which we can uh, discuss and also benefit from uh, in order for us to construct uh, the understanding and concept of how to incorporate uh, the uh, aspect of the metaphysical aspect of Islam um, in the uh, agenda of education. So this is actually something which is very, very beneficial. And we are looking forward to hear and learn from our esteemed speakers. And um, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, what we'll be discussing here will uh, uh, be reflected later on uh, in some of the policies, in some of the undertakings, in some of the... Uh, pedagogical uh, techniques and also approaches in education so that one day inshallah we'll see uh, a notable presence of the metaphysical aspect of which we have been talking about a lot before this but somehow how can you project this presence in our pedagogy in our teaching in our curriculum is something left to be explored so we are recording this one and we will be always revisiting the contents of what our esteemed speakers will be sharing with us, inshallah, this afternoon. Uh, with the Nia of ready to learn, inshallah, and uh, participate in the discussion. Uh, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will always give us the best of his rewards and make this as a platform that we will really and truly benefit. Uh, because normally big things begin with ideas and Allahu alam I mean what can we inshallah reach through this small discussion of ours this afternoon might be something that will uh, be echoed you know elsewhere and somewhere inshallah and uh, something that will always uh, be beneficial for ourselves and for our ummah and for the university now uh, I cannot thank you uh, all our guest speakers enough, but Jazakumullah on their time and also willingness to share their uh, unique perspective in this one so that we can always learn from them and we can always revisit, inshallah, this recorded session for us to uh, always strengthen uh, our understanding on uh, the relation between the metaphysical aspects of Islam and also education in general. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Dr. Jana. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Akmal. Uh, as Professor Akmal mentions, we have four distinguished academics as our panelists today. And just as a kind reminder, each panelist will be allotted 
maximum 20 minutes to, uh, to deliver your address. <clears throat> the other panelists have a cumulative total of 10 minutes to add on to the original address. <clears throat> we will have a question and answer session towards the end of the forum. For a swift question and answer session, I would encourage participants to write down your questions on the chat box so that our panelists can then address each question or similar questions in rounds. <clears throat> our first panelist is Associate Professor Dr. Wan Muhammad Azam bin Muhammad Amin from the Faculty of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences, IIUM. Uh, Dr. Wan Azam attained his Doctor of Philosophy in Islamic Philosophy from the Uni University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, his bachelor's degree is in Islamic Studies, focusing on Usuluddin and philosophy from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, the Malaysian National University. The area of his specialization are religious studies. Uh, the areas of his specialization are religious studies, Islamic studies, and Islamic philosophy, including Islamic aqidah, Sufism, mysticism, and tasawwuf. He is currently attached to the Department of Usuluddin and Comparative Religion, uh, the same faculty, IIUM. Dr. Wan Azam will be addressing Islamic spirituality, Sufism, and intellectual disciplines of Muslim scholars of the past. Welcome, doctor. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Norjanna uh, Jefferson, um, Dr. Dr. Akmal, Prof. Akmal, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Sulaiman from uh, Marmara University, uh, and then uh, Datuk Hamidun, um, uh, Prof. Walid, uh, Prof. Uh, Professor of um, Economics. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, once again, uh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Saint Chris for giving me the opportunity to to express my my idea uh, in this uh, forum. So, um, the topic given to me is uh, Islamic spirituality, Sufism, and intellectual discipline of Muslim scholars of the past perhaps um, i misunderstood the, the 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 topic i just confined uh, myself to the intellectual discipline of of uh, uh, muslim scholars of sufism uh, perhaps this is my 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 uh, weakness uh, in in my uh, presentation today um, can i use the um, and I use the uh, slide. Yes, you can share, Prof. Uh, share. Okay, uh, I will be very brief um, uh, with this. Uh, you see the... <laughs> Humanism. Uh, this is wrong, wrong uh, spelling here. And then uh, my topic is Islamic spirituality, Sufism, uh, and intellectual discipline of Muslim scholars of the past. So uh, uh, I will start with um, Islamic spirit spirituality, al haya al ruhiya lil Islam, fil Islam. Uh, this is a very uh, crucial um, uh, point in, in uh, education uh, because uh, uh, we are um, dealing with um, a man, uh, we are dealing with uh, a human that consists of a body uh, and then uh, ruh and the other one is uh, a human soul, nafsul al-insaniya. So, uh, not much is known about the concept of roof in Islam, except very little. Uh, but unlike the roof, the Quranic verses mainly discuss the concept of human soul, nafsul insan, uh, spiritual heart, eh? nafsul insan, and spiritual heart, al-qalb. Uh, since this matter is not much discussed in the Quran, 
uh, and it's also considered as unseen, Ghaibiyat and Samiyat matter. So the Prophet uh, is another source of knowledge. So this uh, will become the basis for discussion of uh, Islamic spirituality in, in uh, Islamic education because uh, uh, we are dealing with, with uh, man, with the human soul, with the nafs. Eh? And this is uh, what we call a spiritual called. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this one, uh, this uh, spiritual kalb or spiritual heart and the human soul, I think uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, Quranic verses talking about this. And uh, it is also um, uh, part of our um, part of our policies, yeah? part of our international Islamic universities policies, where in the guidelines and uh, policies, yeah? policies and guidelines on on Islamizations. Uh, I think uh, the university has already put this uh, in the. Uh, in the books, in the in the guidelines, and also the another one is the sejahtera. I think uh, also uh, it has discussed at, uh, almost um, all thoroughly uh, regarding these things, uh, regarding these uh, spiritual hearts uh, under the, the under the sejahtera. So. Uh, uh, in, in our education, then, uh, especially the Islamic spirituality, uh, our, our uh, guidelines and our example is the Prophet Muhammad. Eh? And in this, uh, I think uh, the very concept of Ittiba'u Sunnah uh, should be or should become our, our model and should become our our example uh, in, in uh, humanizing education. So why? Because uh, uh, the sunnah of the prophet uh, is very important because uh, it is the person uh, most close to Allah and uh, the revelations uh, revealed to him and he is the most uh, knowledgeable person about the Quran. So his sunnah is the best uh, principle, guideline and example in the Islamic spirituality. So with, with regard to this concept, I think uh, the principle of Ittiba'u Sunnah can be seen in the Quranic verse, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ And then, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوْهَىٰ And then, um, uh, there are many other verses, there are many other verses that become our uh, uh, reference uh, when we talk about the Ittiba'u Sunnah. Uh, so uh, the Ittiba'u Sunnah uh, shall be the, the guideline, shall be the example, shall be the model for, for the, uh, our humanizing education. Um, uh, and then also uh, Ittiba'u Sunnah as well uh, will benefit our physical and spiritual, uh, including uh, the purification of soul, uh, removing al-akhlaq al madmuma and this concept leads to the emergence of Sufi, Sufi al-akhlaqi and Sufi Sunni. And uh, in the uh, concept of educations of the uh, previous scholars, I think uh, apart from um, uh, seeking knowledge apart from practicing the sunnah um, uh, the purification of soul is something important yeah? it's something um, uh, uh, very uh, pertinent yeah? in, in getting knowledge in obtaining knowledge yeah? uh, because uh, uh, as we know that uh, knowledge uh, cannot be obtained if our soul is is uh, dirty or is rusty or something 
like that. Eh? And of course, the, the model, uh, the, the example uh, we should get from the Sunnah of the Prophet. Okay, um, and then uh, uh, one of the basis for the uh, uh, purification of the soul is the, the hadith about Ihsan, uh, when the Prophet said, worshiping God as if you see him, because if you do not see him, he nonetheless see you. So this is um, uh, the basis uh, for our purification of soul. Uh? Tazkiyatun Nafs, eh? because uh, uh, Tazkiyatun Nafs uh, is very important, as important as reading, discussion, research, and so on. <clears throat> I perhaps uh, um, can finish earlier because uh, I just uh, prepare a little bit only. Uh, uh, some of the discipline that grew together with the Islamic spirituality during this time, uh, which is during the time of uh, prophet and companion, uh, the discipline of uh, Isnat, uh, the chain of narrators, the faith, uh, Aqidah, and also uh, the fiqh uh, and others. So uh, in the first uh, century, not really centuries, uh, in the time of the prophet and the companion, uh, I think uh, the disciplines, these disciplines uh, evolve uh, together with the uh, discipline of uh, education and its discipline of uh, Islamic uh, spirituality. Okay, uh, this took place uh, from the birth of the Prophet until the turn of the first century of Hijrah, uh, where the the word tasawuf, uh, the word tasawuf, uh, the terminology of tasawuf uh, was used by Hassan al Basri. Hassan al Basri, who died in uh, 110, 110 Hijrah, yeah? uh, when he said, uh, uh, he referred to a man uh, in front of the Kaaba. I saw a Sufi uh, also with, at, at the place of Tawaf. I gave something to him, but he refused, he refused to, to accept it. So uh, uh, although the spirits of uh, Sufism or the Islamic spirituality has already existed uh, before this, but uh, the term uh, Sufi or Tasawwuf uh, come into existence uh, at the end of uh, first century, 110. Eh? 110, Hassan al-Basri died. So 110, uh, uh, I think uh, the word Sufism or Tasawwuf uh, come into existence. Although the, the spirit and the practice of the uh, Sunnah, the, the understanding of the concept of companion, uh, and then uh, the practice of uh, Zuhud, the practice of uh, Wara, uh, Sabar, Shukur, and so on, has already existed. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, shown by the prophet eh, to the companion, and the, the companion practices eh, uh, uh, wholeheartedly under the term Ihsan and so on. Uh, so from this time, the use of uh, terminology of the South gain currency, and then uh, the followers of the companion, the Tabi'un or Tabi'in, uh, began to use the terminology uh, al, uh, I cannot see. until a man namely Abu Hashim al-Kufi uh, who died in 150 Hijrah uh, was called as a Sufi. Abu Hashim al-Kufi al-Sufi. Uh, he died in 150 Hijrah and uh, he has already already called as uh, a Sufi. Yeah? Uh, so uh, we can see the, the evolve, uh, the growth of the word uh, Sufi actually came from the spirit of Islamic spirituality 
uh, in uh, uh, purifications of soul or purification of heart. Um, and the word tasawuf, uh, scholar disagree on the origin of the word Sufism, whether it is Arabic or other languages, or whether it comes from other languages. Uh, this is a disagreement eh, of the term tasawuf. Uh, but uh, in Islam, I think uh, tarbiyah ruhiya is, is uh, suitable. Uh, and also the purification of soul, tazkiyah to nafs, Tasfiyah to nafs, uh, I think, is much more important than the terminology. But anyway, uh, tasawwuf uh, can also be used, yeah, uh, except that uh, it is based on the sunnah of the prophet. Yeah? Uh, and then uh, the term like sophos yeah, come from the Greek word sophos or sophia uh, come from the Greek word, so it is a foreign uh, terminology. Uh, attributed to Tasawuf. Huh? And the Sufa, uh, uh, the veranda of the Prophet Mosque in uh, Medina, huh? and then uh, the Sufi are uh, similar to Ahl Sufa, the poor companion of the Prophet who lived uh, at the time of the Prophet and during the righteous Caliph, huh? and so on. And so this is only to show that uh, uh, scholars disagreed uh, to the terminology of the Saud, whether it is uh, Arabic or whether it is uh, uh, foreign language. Yeah? And uh, the, uh, the nearest of the foreign language is uh, Greek, yeah? the Greek word Sophos. Um, okay, uh, I will go very brief. And then uh, uh, during these times, I mean, uh, after uh, Tabi'in, uh, Tabi'in, Tabi'in, uh, the Tasawf Akhlaqi or Tasawf Sunni. Yeah? Two types of uh, uh, Tasawf has been uh, divided. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, Tasawf Sunni or Tasawf Akhlaqi. Uh, this type of Sufism maintain uh, practice of the Sunnah of the Prophet, uh, such as reading uh, 99 Asma Ul Husna, um, uh, prayers, uh, uh, salutation, salawat, the rem remembrance of Allah, Zikrullah, are collected from the authentic Sunnah, such as um, collection of uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Al Azkar and Nawawi, Al Ma'thurat, and others. Uh, this disi uh, the discipline that evolved together in this uh, um, uh, in this uh, period, I think. Uh, uh, the discipline of science of the Quran, science of the Hadith, and then Sufi scholars such as uh, al Hasibi, al Junaid, al Ghazali, and others uh, can be put under this, this category. So, this uh, Sufi Sunni uh, maintain the method of practicing the Sunnah, yeah? practicing the Sunnah because uh, the uh, advantages of the practicing the Sunnah and the, the prophets as uh, spiritual doctors eh? uh, because uh, he was the uh, nearest to Allah. He was the one who uh, understand the Quran and he is the one who uh, uh, re uh, received the Quran. Eh? Uh, so this is uh, why this uh, group uh, uh, maintain this type of uh, Sufism. Dr. Azam, three minutes. Yeah? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay, uh, I, I'll, I'll go very fast. And then we have Tasawwuf Ishraqi uh, and Falsafi where uh, uh, scholars started to mix the Sufism with philosophy uh, like uh, Fusus al-Hikam and uh, the names that I mentioned just to put some uh, examples. Huh? Uh, so this is Tasawwuf Ishraqi and from this, uh, we can find uh, a lot of uh, philosophical discussion uh, in their in their uh, writings, yeah? and then after that, uh, almost, almost uh, at the same time, the emergence of Sufi uh, orders or tariqa uh, or Sufi kaums come into existence in the Islamic world, yeah? and then the first among the first is Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. Uh, 
Asura Wardi and uh, Ahmad Arifai, and they have their own uh, writings and they have their own uh, discipline. Eh? Uh, they are writing mainly, um, uh, mainly discuss uh, on this uh, bay'a, silsila, ijazah, zikrullah, rabita, khirqa, and, and others. Eh? And uh, actually, this has been uh, practiced uh, in the Islamic education. Yeah? Islamic education, but rather uh, they are in Sufi order, uh, they are much more uh, strict and rigid, uh, if, if I can say. Yeah? And then uh, we have uh, the writing like Hizbul Bahar of Abdul Hassan, Shazili, uh, Hikam, Kitabul Hikam, Ibn Atta'illah. Uh, and Tanwir Kulub of Amin al Kurdi and so on. So all this actually uh, was in the past, but I think uh, in the universities now, uh, we are also have this type of, of concept, but uh, in a modified, uh, in a, a modern way, yeah? a modern way, if I can say that. And then uh, poems, <laughs> uh, we have also, uh, Masnawi, uh, another type of, of uh, education, uh, and also Maqamat al Hariri. Uh, I think that's enough. Uh, yeah, thank you very much <laughs> for a very brief and uh, uh, unstructured uh, uh, slides. So, thank you very much once again. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wan Azam. Uh, I would like to call upon, let's say, um, to... uh, Professor Suleiman, if you would like to add on to that. Professor how to Suleiman? Get, how to get off from, from <clears throat> this, uh... Uh, I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mashallah Azam made a very uh, good uh, historical uh, you know, summary of Sufism. Uh, it is placed in the Quran and Sunnah. Also, it is, uh, you know, uh, derivation. Uh, I believe it's derivation comes mostly from Safa because when we look at the chapter Shams in the Holy Quran, I counted 11 swearing, uh, Allah, Allah is swearing 11 times in this chapter. The sun, the moon, the night, the daytime, the nighttime, almost everything which is engulfing us is sweared by Allah. So as to uh, bring our attention to an important issue, which is And I don't know any other place in the Holy Quran, Allah is swearing by so many times. Because this subject is so important, and unfortunately this is so much ignored in Islamic societies today, because we only understand Islam as practicing the five uh, pillars and nothing else, unfortunately. Forgetting all this self-awareness, you know, uh, ihsan. And I thank you, uh, Staz, uh, for this, uh, you know, good summary. But the last book, uh, Makamat Hariri, I don't think it has anything to do with Sufism. It is uh, a very literary nice book. Speak about Arabic literature, but Mesnavi is, of course, one of the very uh, essential book of, uh, you know, Sufism in poetry, in uh, a lot of uh, interesting stories. But Makama Tariri is something literary, not uh, so yeah. much attached to, uh, you know, uh, Sufism. Mm. And inshallah, uh, I will uh, build upon uh, what you said, uh, Dr. Azam, inshallah, in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Suleiman. Uh, Dr. Hamidon, would you like to say anything about that? You are muted, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Norjana, and thank you, Dr. Suleiman. My take on this is that when, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Azam is, uh, you know, time is jealous of him. And uh, when he mentioned about among the discipline that uh, there was an early discipline, which is the narration of Hadith, uh, people, I will speak a bit more in, in my, my part later on, but people usually tend to go into Fulan, this Fulan narrated from this Fulan, this Fulan, this Fulan, and this Fulan is Sakha, this is Sakha, this is Sakha, then it's Hadith Sakha. Uh, but if we look into the, uh, the Muqaddimah of Muslim, and even Bukhari, they were mentioning about why the need to be Sakha. 
the elevated position of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is the spiritual, the spiritual, the spirituality there. The, 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 the yakin, the conviction in the heart that you are going to narrate something that comes from the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one that carry this message, this hidayah. So I think that one should be underscored to this, uh, those who narrate the, the hadith. So what I mean to say is that in the Islamic disciplines, if we go back to the, what we can call the intrinsic motivation, why they want to do this. This is the point of the way West Spiritual comes in. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamidun. Um, so I think we, we, we got a good uh, coverage of the uh, history as well as what is most important in terms of uh, following any discipline of the Sufi, as Dr. Hamidun um, has uh, stressed on the conviction of the heart uh, with regard to the tradition of Rasulullah as the intrinsic motivation. We now, I think we should uh, uh, proceed with the next speaker, inshallah. Before that, I would like to remind uh, our participants or our uh, audiences to write down your questions in the chat box so that we can address them later, inshallah. So our next guest uh, is a, our special guest, Professor Dr. Suleiman Derin, uh, Professor of Tasawuf from Marmara University, uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Professor Suleiman did his doctorate at the Department of Arab and Middle Eastern uh, Studies, University of Leeds, England, with his thesis towards some paradigms of the Sufi con conception of love from Rabia to Ibn al Farid. He currently teaches Sufi history, Orientalism, and Sufi exegesis as a professor at the Department of Sufism, Faculty of Theology, Marmara University, Turkey. Please welcome Professor Suleiman to deliberate on Sufism and scientific proliferation a potent complementarity of the Islamic eras. Welcome, Prof. Thank you, Sister Rung Jannah. Uh, I thank you, uh, you know, Centris, for inviting me for such a beautiful as well as important uh, subject because we all need these, uh, you know, discussions so as uh, we can really humanize our education and, and we also, we, we can, you know, uh, uplift our ummah. As you know, we, as in Islamic Ummah, we are now in a big trouble. And uh, as uh, Ustaz Habdun also said, it's because of our uh, problems in education. So inshallah, today I will give a presentation. How can uh, Sufism complement education uh, through Sufi training? Because in Islam, we don't have education only. It is uh, education plus training. For example, we go to Madrasa, if we just teach you how to pray uh, Salat, but you don't uh, pray, is it okay? Uh, yes, I go to university, I learned how to pray, how to give Zakat, but I don't give Zakat, I don't pray. So this is not really education. In Islam, when we speak about education, it is always accompanied by training. But nowadays, unfortunately, you know, we are ignoring this uh, training uh, process and we are only uh, giving significance to delivering the information. So just passing the information is not enough. As Dr. Uh, Azam said, uh, when we look at the hadith of the Ihsan, the Prophet is asked by Jibril three questions. What is Islam? What is Iman? Akhbirni anil Iman. Akhbirni anil Ihsan. And the third question was, what is Ihsan? And the Prophet said, it is to worship Allah as if you see him, even though you don't see him, he sees you all the time. And the first thing, Islam was taken over by the fuqaha. So how we pray, how we give zakat, how we fast, how we go on pilgrimage, all the detailed uh, answers are given by fuqaha in four or five, uh, you know, well-known mazahib, Hanafiya, Shafi'iya, Hanbaliya, Malikiya, uh, even some other minor ahl sunnah mazahib we have. And how to believe in Allah, how to believe in angels, you know, the, what is Iman? This question was answered by, uh, you know, two major Sunni schools, Maturdiya and Ash'ariya. But unfortunately, when it comes to the, what is Ihsan, this is very much ignored, even banned in some countries, you know. 
So the, we have different mazahib, which we call them tariqa. Mazhab and tariqa in Arabic, as you all know, has the same meaning. Have you been to Umrah? They, they tell you, tariq, 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 which means open the path. I open the path. You know, we will, those who carry some uh, heavy burden, it doesn't mean come to Mumbai tariqa, come to Naqshibandiya, no. In that sense, mazhab, tariqa, all uh, same meaning. Well, unfortunately, in many Islamic countries, we lost uh, the ihsan level of all religion. When we look at the Holy Quran chapter Hujurat, the Estrada Qalat al Arabu Amadna, Kulam to Inu Walakin Bulu Aslamma, Aslamna, Walamma Yetkul Imanu Fi Gulubikum. The desert Arab said, We believe. Say unto them, O Muhammad, you believe not. But rather you say, We submit. For the faith has not entered into your hearts. Here Allah Almighty is uh, dividing between Islam and Iman. Islam is just submission. Faith is more spiritual and it is in your heart. And it's not easy to see your faith from outside. But Islam, as I described above from the Hadith, is a third level. So we see that we have three partitions. We have Islam. And when you are strong in Islam, then you, it becomes a faith, strong belief in your heart. Then if you really internalize faith, it becomes ihsan. It's not just belief. You know, I believe in Allah, but I forget it. I believe in the Prophet ﷺ, but I forget Prophet when I am in the market, when I am in doing some shopping. Uh, but, you know, when you have ihsan, you never forget in any place. You always remember Allah. So this is uh, more than faith. So, Inshallah, in this talk, uh, I will give the example of our Ottoman ancestors. As you know, Ottomans are the longest Muslim state in the world. I checked the dates, like Abbasis lived around five centuries, 500 something. Ottomans lived more than six centuries, almost 630 years. And if you ask me the reason why, in my opinion, it is they had a merge of Sufism, Sharia, uh, faith, Iman, all together. Because in Ottoman lands, we have Madrasa, and next to Madrasa, we had the Sufi Lodge, which is, I don't know in which uh, word you are using in Malay language. Is it Tekiya or Lodge or Hankah? I am not sure. Nurjana, do you have any idea? Okay. No, uh, well, no, what? We, Sorry, we, I could we, Pondo, all, all, all this Prof. Salama, all this training we had in uh, the Pondok. We call yeah, Pondok. Pondok. Pondok training. Okay. We so in, next in, to Madrasa. Pondo, in Malaysia, you have the two and also the third one. The all three right. all together in that place. Huh? So next to Madrasa, we had Pondok. So in the Madrasa, you train our mind, or brain. But in the Tekiya, to you lodge, you train your heart. So you become a merciful person. Allah Almighty is saying in the Holy Quran, You know, I find the best example in this respect, Imam Ghazali. His book, Ihya Ulumuddin, looks like a fiqh book because it's, he speaks about uh, Asrarul Salat, Asrarul Sawm, Asrarul uh, you know, Hajj. But really, he says, I wrote this book in a, a fiqh uh, style. But it is a book uh, bringing all this Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. He started with Adat. Sorry, he started with Ibadat. Of course, you have to uh, practice Ibadat if you want to become a Muslim. Then comes, you know, uh, Adat. And I love this. And I explain Sufism like this in many things. For example, people ask me, is music is halal? I give the answer from Ihya Ulumuddin. Uh, Ghazali says, uh, heedless people, gafil, we call it in Arabic, heedless people make ibadat as adat. They turn worship into kind of ceremony, into kind of tradition, without any meaning. But uh, Sufis turn adat into ibadat. So if you say, if music is an adat, I know we have some funny dancing in Malaysia, a kind of 
Remember the uh, Sama, Sister Nur, you said? So dancing and music is adat. In every culture, we have music. But Sufis turn it into a kind of ibadat. So when they turn around, they whirl the whirling dervishes, make zikr. They say, Allah, Allah, Allah. And I love this because whirling is the most universal thing. The world rotates around itself. The galaxies turn around itself. The sun turns, turns around itself. We turn around the sun. So we go tawaf, we turn around to Kaaba. So Sufis caught this and made this an ibadat, also a, a beautiful art. Anyway, when you come back to Ottoman lands, in Ottoman, uh, you know, uh, culture, for centuries, we had madrasa, and uh, we had uh, this panduk, this uh, Sufi lodge, together. So all scholars, not only intellectually developed, they also uh, developed spiritually. And uh, I would like to explain that in Sufism, we have different techniques. Actually, today, as you all know, uh, EQ, I, sorry, IQ was very important in so many years. In secular schools, they always emphasize the, uh, you know, IQ, intelligence uh, quotation. Why? Because you have to make more tests, you have to become a good, uh, you know, engineer, good architect. But without spirituality, without good morals, we saw that that doesn't help. You can be a good engineer, but you can uh, invent atomic bombs. You can uh, teach people how to destroy humanity. As you know, we have war going on in uh, Ukraine now, and every morning we are scared that uh, one day uh, one madman will use these atomic bombs and destroy thousands and millions of people, you know. So technology without spirituality is not something good. It's harmful. All the internet technology today we are using, all these uh, social media, unfortunately, a lot of harm to uh, our morality, you know. They uh, advertise all kind of nakedness, all kind of immoral uh, homosexual relationships. So really, technology without mercy, without spirituality, is mostly, uh, you know, harmful. In Ottoman lands, we had the Sufis, uh, Sufi morality, controlling the madrasa, as well as the kings. You know, our famous Fatih Sultan Muhammad, he was the murid. He's a Bayrami Sufi. So he was always controlling his anger. He was advising the king, uh, do this, do that, be merciful to uh, people, uh, you know, uh, follow the Sharia. And we have uh, also Sultan Abdul Hamid, you know, he's very famous, not giving Palestine to Jews at that time. Ottoman state was in a big trouble financially and the Jewish people wanted to give a lot of gold. But he didn't sell it. He was following a Shazeri Sheikh, for example. Again, I am giving uh, these examples from the very well known names by you. Like, you know, Sultan Ahmed Mosque, which is called Bulu Mosque. He was following uh, another uh, Azmam Tudayi, another famous Sufi. So they were always, uh, you know, checked and balanced <clears throat> by the Sufis. There's a German, actually, historian. Uh, he says, Ottomans are Sufi state. Because also in our, in our army, we had Bektashi Sufi order. In the army, there is a Sufi group who were uh, training as well as uh, giving, uh, boosting their morality in terms of uh, Sufi mercy. So, you know, uh, we should not separate uh, spirituality in the universities uh, and we should do it both. We should teach our children, our uh, youngsters, you know, university students, yes, about science. And I believe IAUM is realizing that even Centris is really good example of, uh, you know, Islamicizing the knowledge. Really, we need this very bad in our century because our children are learning all this uh, technology without soul and they are becoming westernized. They are becoming alienized to our uh, Islamic, uh, you know, uh, culture. And uh, my understanding is we should create this Rabbani Alim. Maybe you heard about Imam Rabbani, a Sir Hindi from India. He was a scholar, faqih, a mutakallim, also a great Sufi. Actually, a mujtahid, 
in all, all these three sciences, he was a mushtahid in fiqh, mushtahid in kalam, mushtahid in Sufism. So I think he's very close to your lands, to Malaysia. One very good example, I, I talked about Ihya Ulumitin. Remember, Ihya Ulumitin is talking about vices as well as the virtues. And he says, love is the highest station. And all these other makamat, tawbah, uh, patience, these are preliminary, preparatory for love, divine love. And other things like shukur, hamd are the end results of love. So I think we need love today. I was a friend of Ustaz Malik Pedro Rahimahullah from your university in his last three years in Turkey. And when he saw my PhD on divine love, he said, that's what we need today in Islamic world. We lack this love. Because why? I give two reasons. Uh, in Islamic countries, we have two kinds of education. One is secular, as I said before, only concentrating on uh, you know, academic success. Uh, they don't care for morality. They don't care for worship, prayer. They don't care. Another big problem in Islamic uh, countries, unfortunately, uh, you know, we have uh, these extremist groups, this ISIS, this Khariji mentality that uh, they don't like spirituality. They don't like Sufism. They say this is bid'ah. How can Islam become bid'ah? You know, how come Tezkiyah can be bid'ah? How can loving and mercy can be bid'ah? For so many years in the Islamic world, we are, uh, you know, having this difficulty in these, uh, you know, rich uh, Gulf countries. Uh, you know, uh, they are against spirituality. They find it as sick. I think we should, of course, I am not telling every Gufi Sufi is good. There are some Sufi movements that are really bad. I accept this. But there are good and bad in every movement, you know. There are good and bad in, there are good Muftis, there are bad Muftis. There are good mutakallim, you know. There are also bad mutakallims. Now there's a, for example, a movement called perennialism. They say anyone can enter paradise. You don't have to become a Muslim. You can be a Jew. You can still enter the paradise. You can be a Christian. You can be a Hindu. They open the doors for everyone. So why why bother with Islam? You know, pray five times a day. Don't drink alcohol. Don't eat pork. So there are good things and bad things in every movement. We should accept this. And of course, we should choose the best ones. I have a lot of Malaysian students, by the way. I know Malaysia quite well. Uh, one of my students studied the fatwa by the muftis of Malaysia about Sufism. Actually, there are very good fatwas about, you know, all this jahri zikir, about this stuff. I know Malaysia is very, uh, you know, cautious about Sufi movements, which is okay. I accept this, but we should really, I mean, need Sufi, Sufi love, Sufi mercy, Sufi toleration, of course, with Sharia. Uh, nowadays, we lack this in uh, Islamic countries, therefore, we have this ISIS. Muhammad al Yaqub is describing this movement, misinterpreted Islam into a religion of harshness, brutality, torture, and murder. So, we unfortunately we have this problem in Islamic lands. We don't, uh, therefore, I love this your project of, you know, humanizing the education. So my suggestion, we have in Sufism, I don't know how many minutes I have, Sister Nur Um, You have about uh, uh, eight minutes. Oh, or I, I am happy. I have plenty of time. So, you know, we should revive or we should borrow some Sufi techniques and bring them to our universities, to I, I, UM. Like, for example, you know, uh, we have so much consumerism problem today. We love to consume. Actually, calling a man, a human being, as a consumerist is really, in my opinion, a very bad naming. Look at Zuhd, for example, in Tasawuf. Look at Kana'a. Because Sufis, ascetics, uh, you know, for centuries, they said we can uh, survive on minimum things. Don't consume too much. You know, قِلَّةُ taam, قِلَّةُ kalam, قِلَّةُ manam. Today, we have so much problem in Islamic uh, lands. One side is consuming too much. Another side, they have nothing to consume. There is famine, there is hunger. So I think we can bring this ascetic, for example, ideals back to our educational system. Because when you're ascetic, then you can be more generous to others. Because we are either an egoist person, just thinking of yourself, just spend for yourself as this 
consumer society, this, uh, you know, uh, capitalist system says, you are the only one, you should, you should look after yourself. Don't think of others, you know. So, for example, environmental crisis. I mean, in Sufism, we think everything is alive. You said before, behind the Rabbi. Every being is, uh, you know, is making zikr of Allah. The trees, the flowers, the water. You cannot contaminate water. As the Prophet ﷺ said, don't use water. Even you are taking ablution from a river, don't waste it. I mean, we come from such a beautiful culture. But unfortunately, when you look at the, uh, you know, uh, this percentage of wasting bread and other things, Islamic country always at the top. We produce little, we consume too much, and we have famine and hunger and poverty, mostly in Islamic countries. Again, psychological problems, all this, you know, tefekkur. Uh, unfortunately, today, we don't have alternatives to yoga and other things in the, uh, these mystical systems of Eastern religions. In Sufism, we have an uh, alternative for everything. As I said, we have Sufi music. Why you have to go and listen to Western pop music when you have the beautiful, uh, you know, Sufi hymnies in short? And when, why you go and make yoga when we have tefekkur, when we have murakabe? So Sufis are always producing alternatives. And I know today in every school in America, in the West, in, in hotels, they have yoga classes. You know, yoga is okay, not very bad. I mean, you just empty your mind. Forget about religious aspect uh, as contemplation, meditation. You are forgetting about, uh, you know, uh, negative things. It is okay. But Sufi says, Ghazali says, it is you bring two information and create the third. So tefakir is much better than yoga. You empty the mind, then you fill it with useful ilmi nafia. So we have the best things in Islam, in Sufism. Uh, you know, Sufism is not separate from Islam, but Sufis gave more energy and time and observation on the spiritual techniques. So as, uh, you know, Holy Quran says, uh, about the soul, you have been given very little knowledge. But out of this little knowledge, Sufis took all this knowledge from the Quran, but they observed for a thousand years. They entered into Khalwa for 40 days. They always contemplated on the soul, on the vices, on the virtues. So when we look at the Ghazali, when we look at Rumi, we find the map of soul. Very detailed information about Nafsi Ammara, Lawama, Mulhima, Mutmaina. I think they're all very good for psychology. And when Ustaz Malik Petr was in Turkey, we made some beautiful programs with him. How can we Islamicize psychology? And how can we put make Sufism more available for everyone? Not just for Sufis entering into Sufi Lodge and spend 30 years to become instant Kamil. It's too much. Not everybody is so patient. So we can bring, for example, when I talk about Zucht, asceticism, now we have this minimalism in the West. People are always trying to minimize their consumption. So we could do that, you know, as Muslims. We could invent this movement, not the Western people. Because in Islam, we have all these basics. And finally, I, I talked about service, khidmah, giving service to Muslims. Some of the things I will tell today might be very awkward because uh, in Sufi lodges, the Dervish the will do all kinds of jobs. You could peel off the onions and potatoes, cook the food for your friends, clean the toilets, and uh, give food to the poor people. All these Sufi lodges were centers of soup kitchens. All the poor people would come and eat free of charge. So, I mean, uh, now we don't have this. In our universities, everything is paid by the government. People come and clean the uh, you know toilets for you, clean your tables, clean your windows. You don't have to do anything. Am I right or wrong, uh, Sister Rujanda? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, even the girls, girls, girls schools. My wife is working in a girl school, Tahfiz al Quran. Girls are memorizing the Quran. When they get up, they don't even uh, check their bed. You know. Another lady come and check their bed. I mean, this is 
not uh, training, you know, this education, okay? But these needs, you know, when you read Imam Ghazali, he says, ilim, then comes what Sister Durjadna, ilim, amal, and hal. So, ilim with no amal is useless. And Sufism, whenever you learn something, you don't go to the next stage without practicing it first. So this is very important technique. We should borrow it from Sufism. And we should ask our students to prepare projects for the poor people of Malaysia, for the poor people of Africa. How can we help the immigrants, Syrian immigrants, immigrants from Yemen? How can we solve the poverty problem in Islamic lands? So even you are studying engineering, even you are studying, uh, you know, architecture, you should have also uh, some lessons which are giving this emotional intelligence to you. And I think in Islamic lands, we don't have this much. In, in Turkey, we are trying now to put some kind of, these kind of projects into high schools. And I myself, whenever I have PhD students, I love this kind of subjects, always touching, uh, you know, humanity. Uh, for example, rather than studying something happened in history, then no good for us today. I always uh, advise my students to study like contemplation in Islam, asceticism in Islam. How can we bring ascetic lifestyle to, to modern life today? Of course, without becoming funny. We cannot have, you know, like Ibrahim bin Atab living in a cave. No, I don't mean this. You can still drive a beautiful car. Malaysian made cars, I know. We have three Malaysian cars. And you can have in a nice house, but you can, have, you can be a spiritual person, you know. Think of other Muslims. And this is a thing that we should do it uh, in high schools, in universities. I just would like to uh, give some, uh, you know, uh, example from Bahatu Nakshiband. Uh, oh, no, Nakshiband, yeah. Sorry. Bro, one minute. Last example, a very good example. Bahatu Nakshiband was trained by his uh, master, Emir Kulal. Uh, in, he said, seven years, you clean the roads. For seven years, he was like a sweeper. And the next seven years, he said, you look after the animals. He was carrying uh, the dogs, wounded dogs, the birds, broken wings. And the next seven years, he said, you could look after the sick people in hospitals. And he completed Sufi training like this. Remember, I said Sufi training. I am not saying Sufi education. Training involves also education. So we, I think, can humanize and those names, Bahatu Nakshiband, Imam Ghazali, became great people because of this joining uh, physics and metaphysics, ilim, amal. Therefore, they became great people. Their knowledge became blessed and purified, you know. Inshallah, we follow this path. I thank you very much, Sister uh, Rujadna. I thank you, uh, your center, centuries, and uh, hope to uh, be with you in future, Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Suleiman. I can pick up certain things from what you have mentioned and perhaps then I will open it to the other uh, two um, um, panelists. Technology without spirituality and mercy is dangerous. Uh, technology without a soul, of course, it is also danger dangerous. We should learn from the Ottoman, for example, whereby the Sufis advising uh, the madrasa as well as the sultans for check and balance love, or if I'm not mistaken, Aishq, Prof. Aishq as the highest station, divine love, mercy, toleration, which is lacking in Muslim countries. And therefore we should borrow some Sufi techniques, for example, khidmah. So I would like to call upon Dr. Wan Azam uh, to uh, give some inputs on this. Dr. Wan Azam? Yes, yes, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Sulaiman. It is very interesting to, to hear from you and uh, uh, it is the job uh, or the role of the Sufis uh, uh, to do this. And uh, I would love to hear some from you regarding Sainursi, how his uh, Islamic spirituality has been translated into uh, liberating the 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 the, the muslim uh, at that time uh, to to practice islam uh, in its 
a real um, what the real spirit of Islam. So that that is I would love to hear from you. But uh, any uh, that, uh, everything that you said just now is wonderful. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wanazan. Um, Prof. Suleiman, can you in like two minutes respond to that? Yes. We'll see yes, how was it then. You know, uh, Ustaz Said Nursi is again a great man like Ghazali mm. uh, because he joined Islam, Iman and uh, Ihsan. But unfortunately, in 1923, when we established Turkish Republic, in 1925, Sufism was banned because uh, Sufi groups are considered as a kind of threat to state, you know, because you are changing everything upside down. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Ustaz Said Nursi didn't use Sufism. He was a Sufi himself, a Qadri or Nakshi Dervish, doing a lot of Zaskar, but his technique was more a mutakellim, a kelami technique. He was trying to save, he said, I am trying to save Iman. And he said, this is no time for Sufism. He said this. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Sufism is high level. Uh, it's like, I mean, in 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 uh, Iman, we are trying to save uh, people's faith and put them into paradise. But Islam is like you are trying to get higher, uh, uh, you know, floors in the paradise. So he said, my time is time of saving Iman. I am trying to save faith. No, no time for Sufism. And he was right, actually. At that time, I mean, how can you say? Sister Jenna, you should pray tahajjud, you should do some uh, nawafil, because that time it was difficult to do even the farce. Mosques were closed down and people couldn't pray. Islam was taken into Turkish, you know, translated into Turkish. So, uh, yes, I love him. I love his books. But he had to use uh, Kelami method, which is uh, allowed at that time in Turkey, because uh, Iman was not banned at that time. You can't ban Iman. But uh, all Turuk, Nakshibandi, Kadri were banned. So he made a great service to uh, Turkish people to save their Iman. And he has a really great man. Thank you. Thank Mashallah. You. Thank you very much, Prof. Suleiman. Uh, we You talked about um, uh, Ilm, Amal, and Har, i.e. knowing, doing, and being. Uh, Dr. Hamidun, your comment, please. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Suleiman. Uh, this is a meeting of hearts. Uh, the heart are speaking now. You know, it's yeah. no more things are logical. And and this is the thing. This is part of humanity uh, because of their during the Atlantaman era, because of perhaps their the war with the church, they threw everything in religion. But the thing is that now they have come to realize, inshallah, I'll explain this a little bit more. They've come to realize that it is part of humanity, of the human uh, makeup, you know. And like the Prophet is saying about this uh, alim, yes, the knowledge and it appeals to the cognitive, which Al Ghazali call al aqal And then it has to be Ahwal al qalbiya which is the Hal al qalb which uh, Ghazali also said it must go to Qalb first before it can be trans, tra, tra, trans, uh, uh, transferred or manifested in action and akhlaq, which is the Amal. So thank you very much, Prof. Yes, we are students of Ghazali all the time. <laughs> thank you. I thank you very much. Also, I send my prayers to Ustaz Malik Pedri for his great endeavor to Islamize the psychology. Thank I mean, you. Um, I mean, yes. Jazakumullah uh, khairan kathira. Now uh, we will move to our next panelists. Thank you very much, Professor Sulaiman, as well as uh, Dr. Hamidun and Dr. Wan Azam for your input. Now we move on to uh, the next panelist, uh, Dr. Hamidun bin Abdul Hamid, a very senior academic fellow of uh, the Faculty of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences, IIUM. Currently, he is in our department, Fundamental and Interdisciplinary Studies, together with me. Dr. Hamidun attained his uh, GCE from Loughborough Technical College, England, MA in Teaching of Arabic as Second Language from Khartoum International Institute for Arabic Language, Diploma of Education, Arabic and Islamic Education, and Bachelor of Education from Omdurman Om Islamic University, the Sudan. A very senior academic fellow and a seasoned educator of IIUM, and once a deputy rector of the university, Dr. Hamidun is well grounded in Islamic spiritual traditions and a healthy penchant for science. 
<laughs> a healthy penchant for science and things that are very, uh, um, you know, like like big uh, motorcycles and things like that. <laughs> All right, welcome Dato with your address you on spiritual much. education, spiritual discipline and scientific endeavors, lessons from our heritage. Welcome Dato. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala man wala. First and foremost, thank you very much Dr. Nurjana and thank you Centris in the leadership of uh, Pro Akmal for inviting me. Uh, 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 what they call it uh, as academician, I'm not a pro academician, so I'm just uh, what they call one who reads and would like to share and uh, sharpen up my you know knowledge whether there's any mistakes and so on. So thank you very much. So my my take on this is that when you mentioned about first, uh, I have already said that this is humanizing education, meaning for us basically making it wholesome, holistic bringing it back, bringing it back to the uh, state of where uh, even in the prior, in, even in what they call it, the, the basic or the, 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 what they call it, the society, very basic uh, uh, society, primeval you might call it, they have this uh, physical aspect to the education of searching for food, trying to find food, and struggling to survive, and also the spiritual aspect of where they recognize the powers that we surrounding them in terms of the natural powers. Then we as a society, from the primitive, that's the word, primitive society, we become more and more and more, but that's the uh, discussion. But for me, for me myself, I believe that we are not primitive society. When Adam alayhi salam came, it is not the Neanderthal man. When Adam alayhi salam came, he has our faculties, perhaps the body is being created from earth, but, you know, is uh, uh, and we, we blow into him a roof from us. So we are from a higher up, something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is this spiritual part that we should be giving importance to as well, for both, right? So humanizing education in that is that we bring back the human being to achieve the highest potential, the most comprehensive uh, prowess or most comprehensive ability that he, he uh, the person has. So I would rather go into going for this humanizing education. I would mention first the faculties that has been mentioned by Al Ghazali himself about this uh, physical part, which we call psychomotor in the modern context about the mind part, the intelligence, the, the brain, that will be this cognitive part. And then we have the heart, which they are now, they are now going to try to discover with 40,000 cells discovered, which they call uh, the thinking cells of the heart. And we, they discovered the transportation system in the brain, they call neurons, in the heart they call neurites to, to, to differentiate. They say it performs a level of thinking, but we do not know yet what sort of thinking that is doing. So they will discover later on the heart as we know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Afala yatadabbaruna al-Quran am ala kulubin akfaluha. It doesn't say ala ukulin. It say ala kulubin. Right? That Allah said, Don't they under, can, can, they, can they not go to the depth, understand to the, from the forward, that bara going to the back. So meaning going to the, the bottom of things and reaching the fact that it becomes a fact because as we know from the Greek time, it says that a fact or knowledge is something that is a truth that is believed in and it can be justified. But for us, when we do tadabbur, we come to the stage to the end of the, uh, of the knowledge, we come to the deepest end and then we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the thing that is there in the heart. Then you have the cell, the cell of emotions, nafsul lawama, nafsul maratum bisu, which they call the effective part. And then we have the ruh, which they do not consider at all, but they are doing research. And recently I read an article where they say there is life after death because the consciousness carried on because they said it has been measured by our, uh, our instrument that the brain keep on giving beta wave after 10 minutes of clinical death pronouncement 
and some of the corpses give birth away after a few weeks that they are dead. So you have to search it up in the in the science papers. But so now basically they say if consciousness is on, then you know there's another life after that. So this is what we have. We must bring people back, uh, bring up this this spirituality. That is the first thing. And I would like to say that in our heritage, if I ask you, uh, Imam Ghazali, you would say what philosopher. Right? That's the first thing. If I ask you about Ibn Haytham, you will say physics, you will say uh, that, and then uh, you say even other ulama. So most of ulama, when, when, when it's presented to us, I do not know uh, in other places, but here in Malaysia, when it's presented to us, they are the super people in a certain area. Right? We forgot that, you know, like, like, like Ibn Sina, you know, that he's the father of a thief and so on and so on. We forgot that he's also Usuli. We forgot that he's also a philosopher, this sort of thing. So so, so is the case, Imam Ghazali. We forgot he's also good at mathematics. We forgot that in one of his books, he, he gave Ishara that uh, the, the, the implication, the impact of certain sounds upon the psychology, upon the heart of the people. So that means he's a musicologist, but we lost that book, right? But he mentioned it in, in the book about this, this sort of alim. So, if you say a Shafi'i, people say Imam Shafi'i, very good at, at you know, at, 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 uh, at, uh, at fiqih and so on and so forth. We seldom hear all this Imam, right? Uh, let me see, right? For example, I make a note here, right? Kana ma'rufan bil warak. He is known to be warak. Wa kasratul ibadah. Wal waqar, wal iklas. Right? That's Imam Abu Hanifa. But we seldom get this sort of the story. We got the side where he is good at fiqh, and because of uh, the situation of very little hadith around his area, he's into the akli side, you know, and this sort of thing. Okay. Then we have, uh, for example, Jama'a Baina Ruhaniyat ad din Right? Fi Safa al ibadah which is the transparency of, of, of the heart, right? And uh, the death of Iman. And uh, also Zuhud in dunya. Then you say, for example, like another one. daim al ishtigal kasir It's always busy working, reading, writing kasir al-tazir. at zahud And he's also a Zuhud. So we learn about this cognitive aspect and so on and so on. We usually left out the zuhud part. Even our Imam Shafi'i, when we tell people about that, he's also a qayyam, a person who stands at night and so on and so forth. A person who is also scientific and also he's good in tib. People don't know that. Imam Shafi'i always prescribed to people what to do, right? So this is, I would say, the, 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 the off-forgotten realm, right? the spiritual and akhlaq part of our leaders, you know? And, and going even to the, the, to the uh, generation of the Sahaba, how many Sahaba of the Sahaba that can you say of ulama plus, meaning the knowledge, right? So most of them, those who are in the shura of Omar radiallahu anhu at his time, those that he did not allow to go for jihad, these are the ulama. But most of the sahaba are functional ulama, practice of ulama. And because of the clear heart and because of the clear hablu min Allah is so strong, they have this innate feeling of what should be done. You know, then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has trained them in lot. And then if we go into the hadith, inshallah, the hadith material, we can see how Rasulullah trained them. They, they come to the time when Basically, they can, you know, like, uh, decide on their own, make ishtihad on the best of, because of that, uh, Iman and, and, and Ahsan, perhaps, also the, 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 the level of Ahsan. So we mentioned the of, uh, forgotten realm is that the spiritual and the akhlaq part of the ulama. We only focus on their cognitive or their uh, academic, uh, academic uh, uh, excellence. Now, 
when we look into the history of this ulama, then we come to realize that our scholars, even the modern one, even the modern one, they may have two things in their education, right? The first one is the bi'a. I want I would like to call it the bi'a or the, the ambience, the environment surrounding them, right? Whether in their family or whether in the, in the teachers, this is traditionally. So even in, in a modern sort of era, it's either in the family or the pondo, where they have the teacher, the katatib in Arabic, right? Uh, perhaps in, in, in the madrasa in, 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 uh, in Turkey and in, 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 in Arabic. So you have the environment of knowledge and also the environment of people practicing <laughs> spiritual practices like the Sufi uh, pondo or the Sufi, that they call it, right? Now, Apart from that, you must have that bi'ah, you must also have the kudwa, the good example, the teachers who can provide that. So as we say, if the teacher doesn't have it, then he cannot give it to somebody. And uh, as we say in Bahasa Melayu, uh, the father crab can only teach the son to walk sideways. So the father himself must have that, right? So these are the things that, that, that should be there. There should be kudwa, there should be bi'ah. Then on the level, if you look why Ottoman has been very successful, you'll find that I would call it the Qiyada al-Hakima, wise Qiyada, wise leadership. And things come, uh, you know, that, that is something that is needed. So you find that the, 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 the Khulafa of Islam has always been uh, giving support to the ulama, right? It's seldom fine. Even I think the Mongols, right? Even the Mongols, when I read the history of the Mongols, they don't kill the ulama. You know, they slaughter everyone, but if he's an ulama, no, they let him be, right? They, 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 they don't kill people with, 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 uh, with knowledge. And when uh, Amir Taimur, the Muslim Mongol, he came, he support all the ulama, basically. He's a Muslim anyway. So this is the thing that they should be there. Now, looking back into the life of them, the natural environment. I would say that perhaps because they are being the tarbiyah, the education, right? A, a, a part of, uh, of the education is to uh, practice what they know. It's always been there since, since before. It is only now that uh, we feel that there is separation between a scholar, he must have great knowledge, then his practice doesn't have to reflect what he has. But from our Islamic viewpoint, we don't call an alim an alim unless he practices his alim, right? We don't call uh, an alim a scholar a, no, uh, a scholar until he has good uh, ethics that, uh, showing uh, his, his good knowledge, right? The manifestation of that knowledge is in the good ethics. And the manifestation, like you said, you go into any Sufi tradition, the manifestation of, uh, of good Sufism, good uh, relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be good for the, to the human being. We have the Abbas Allah anhu one day while he was doing, uh, was he was doing atikaf in the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the month of Ramadan and uh, an Arabi, a Bedouin Arab came and said, where is Said Abbas, the Abbas? So they showed him and he said, you are a Sahabi of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I had a problem with a Sahaba. He bought something from me, but he haven't paid yet, as we have agreed. Can you please be my inter intercessor? So Abd Abbas uh, cut his atikaf in Ramadan in the mosque of the Prophet, and he went with this brother and settled his problem with the other uh, Sahabi, and he came and he came back. And when his students, the people suddenly asked him, for this Arabi, you came out of the, the Atikaf of the Prophet Mos in this one. He said, the Prophet right? for you to be quick, tas'a, sai, haja akhika, to, to help in, in the need of your brother, is better than Atikaf in my Mos, in this man, this holy man, right? for so many years, right? Some say 14 or even 40 uh, autumn, right? So this is part of that spirituality that has been practiced by uh, the Sufis and, and by 
some of the people, right? So when we look at these people, they see the natural environment, they see the natural environment as something to be looked at, not only at the special, not only at the thing. Brother Suleiman was saying about that the plants are doing transfer and so on. You know, in, 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 in scientific terms now, in scientific, modern scientific, not, not the quantum physics yet, the quantum, uh, the, 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 the Newtonian and the Einstein uh, physics, uh, you know, this is non-living things. Living thing plants, things and so on. But I'm asking them, isn't there a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that when after some time they built a member for him, he used to stand on this stump of date, they call it a stump of date palm stem. Then when they build a member, they bring this big piece of the uh, stem to the back of the uh, rauda. So it's, we call it rauda now, the whole mosque of the Prophet at that time. And then the, when the, on Juma, the Prophet came out, the first Juma, he came out on the new member. Every one of them, I think rauda could fit about 2,000 people. Every one of them heard the stem crying just like a child until the Prophet, so just like a baby, yeah? until the Prophet Sallallahu came down and, you know, just stroke it a few times and then it keeps quiet, becomes quiet. Are you saying this term is, it didn't mention in the, in the narration that there's a gene hiding there. No, no, no. It mentioned the stump and about more than hundreds, hundreds of Sahaba were there in Juma and the Sahabia as well. And, and, you know, is it dead? Now, this is the, the question. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Quran, wa in min shay'in illa yusabbiru bihamdi. That not a thing, but give his praises. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya, da, ya jibalu awibi ma'a Dawood. Oh, mountains, <laughs> stones, and everything. And then what about this uh, uh, Abdullah, ibn, Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhuma? The Hasaba who follow literally what the Prophet did, anything. So he came to a place, he turned his uh, camel to a stone and he said, Wa alaykum wa salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And the people surrounding him were surprised and they asked him, What are you giving, who are you giving, you know, replying salam to? He said, I don't know, but I came with the Prophet. The Prophet stopped here and facing the stone and said, Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. So that is why in some of our nasheed, they say, and the stone gives salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Eh, batu-batu, berkata-kata beri salam pada dia. So, lima minit. Yeah, yeah, no. So, close, you know, looking at nature, our, you see that our ulama, they try to discover the things. Especially, you know, the signs of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Surely we will show you our signs. Anurihim ayatina. In the horizons and in themselves until it become clearly, right? Proven repetitively because the word is yatabayyana. So mm -hmm. with every addition of the form, there's addition of the meaning. That is one thing. So in the end, we find that they are researching things and so on and so on until that uh, recent, I mean, a few years back, the, the the BBC have a program with Ben Skinsley explaining the scientific discoveries of the Muslim civilization, and without this discovery, we don't have our civilization right now. Right. So, as far as uh, in our tradition, science has always been accepted and has always been something that is very, very, very uh, important to the stage that Imam Shafi. Being, uh, being, being one of a uh, uh, good at uh, tip at, at medicine, he's saying that fiqh is important for the uh, religion, but medicine is important for the bodies, right? At the same level. So what happened now is that we have to carry on this tradition of spiritually, we are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we are using our faculties to strengthen our spiritual yaqeen through understanding what is surrounding us in the cosmos, as they call it. So science and spirituality, if we're coming, right? If we are coming now in the present era, we see that even human being quantum scientists are looking at quantum level. And they say that at this quantum level, 
things are vibrating, things are vibrating, the nature of vibrating a wave, and you're alive, quote and unquote, alive. So everything is basically alive, right? They even have a, an experiment where they see things are vibrating, and then when we are watching, they stop vibrating, you know, as if they are, they are, they are aware of what that, that we are watching. So these are things that we, in the future, and in the future, they are working now, especially the scientists, they are working on the, uh, on the idea of uh, uh, type one, type two, type three, type four civilization. I read it started with uh, uh, what they call it, uh, Nikolai Karbachev, who mentioned that the future global civilization, we are talking about Western and Islamic. Western are becoming spiritual now. In the, in the future, be a global civilization, mostly based on the scientific uh, uh, advancement, but they are trying to say as well that science will explain everything. We are telling them science are just manifestation of Allah. This is where we are to bring them. You are still going to go around with the essence of the creator. We are talking to you about the essence of the creator. So you are going into the Zen. You are going into the, we still created the environment. We are talking. You take your emptiness, like you said just now, the meditation. In karate, brother Suleiman, we do have that as well. You have to sit down and empty yourself. I say, I cannot empty. Uh, or sensei, I cannot empty my mind. It will always be Allah there. So, okay. Then. <laughs> so, this is the thing that we should go in for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamidun. Alaykum as alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. I would like to pick up uh, your last point, uh, which is talking about Ayatullah. Uh, inside ourselves, inside humanity, as well as inside the cosmos. And, um, and, and as uh, you mentioned, our ulama in the past, tried, even in, in, at present, tried to discover Allah's science until it becomes very, very clear. And uh, we have to carry on this tradition to strengthen our yakin, whereby science and spirituality must go hand in hand, hand in hand. Uh, and uh, for the global global future civilization, Islam, our our relevance does not just go only to the created, but we go to the creator. Prof. Wali, would you uh, add on to this? Prof. Wali, uh, you are muted. Um, thank you much, uh, actually. Jannah, thank you much for that, and also our colleagues, uh, Prof. Suleiman and Dr. Wan Azam. I think uh, uh, the arrangement of the discussion is very, uh, is very, uh, uh, very successful up to now. Uh, and the issue of the intellectual tradition uh, started by uh, uh, Wan Azam, and then uh, stress on um, Sufism is not really. Unfortunately, some people, when we talk about spirituality and Sufism, they will have the impression of uh, hallucination. <laughs> and uh, this is very unfortunate. This is very unfortunate. And uh, what we know from our history, what we know from our tradition is actually uh, spirituality and Sufism is actually a deep intellectual tradition, a very deep intellectual tradition. And um, this is what is pointed in, in this discussion. And also it was complemented by uh, what the Prophet Suleiman mentioned about uh, the relation between uh, the amal and the uh, uh, activities and also the hal, which hal I prefer that it's the habitual thing. So, so all this good uh, conduct becoming habitual. And this is simply the interpretation of the word hal in Sufism. It is a habitual issue. And um, uh, and I, I do agree, of course, I do agree with all of this. And this is what we need uh, to transform the human being to be a habitual good person, a habitual good person. He or she doesn't need to do effort to do goodness. Uh, this is the, the main idea. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Walid. I would like to also pick up uh, something that Dr. Hamidon mentioned earlier in that uh, according to our heritage, the Sahaba, our scholars, our leaders, they were polymaths, um, uh, scholars of many different uh, fields of knowledge. Uh, but these have been highlighted many times, except for one thing that they are wara, 
They are sincere, godly, God-fearing. They have this transparency of the heart. They have the strength of Iman, Zuhud, uh, as the oft-forgotten realm of these leaders. Uh, Prof. Suleiman, could you please uh, pick up on that? Uh, Imam Ghazali is really explaining this very well. He says uh, Imam Shafi was a very pious man. He divided his night into three parts. One part he was worshipping. One part with ilim and one part with sleep. Imam Abu Hanifa was a very pious man. He was a businessman. One day a lady came to him. He, she wanted to sell some you know, cloth. And Imam said, how much you want? He said, 10 dinar, for example. This is too cheap. Increase. He said, okay, let's make it 20. He said, even then this is very cheap. Increase a little bit more. You know, the lady became angry with Imam. She said, are you mock making mockery of me? If you want to buy it, buy it. Imam paid 400 dinars for this piece. It was a valuable piece. This is spiritual, this is mercy, you know. An old lady maybe brought a kind of piece of cloth because he says, Imam Ghazali said, we just know their fiqh because their fiqh was so great. We we'll forget about piety, we we'll forget about their mercy. They were very pious, very merciful, you know, sharing and caring for the ummah. Yes, they were great giants of Islamic knowledge, fuqaha. But he said, Imam Ghazali says, we we'll forget about their spirituality. So people think Imam, uh, you know, Abu Hanifa is just an imam in fiqh. He doesn't practice. He just talks. He doesn't practice. No, it's not like this. So I think, uh, as Ustaz Hamdun very clearly explained, we should uh, imitate our, uh, you know, blessed ancestors in spirituality, in knowledge. You know, as Ustaz Valid said, you know, it's very sad that people speak against Sufism. Ibn Taymiyyah was a great Sufi, you know. He was criticizing the evils of Sufis, which is okay. But he was, uh, he loved, he was in love with Abdul Gailani, Rahimahullah. So we should bring this Tawheed, Tawheed of uh, knowledge, practice, and habitualities, as Dr. Velid said. It becomes a habit. You don't do good sometimes from one time to another time. No, it becomes your character. Like a Muslim is like the hunter of goodness. Whenever he, he sees some good, he just pick it up and do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lehman. Jazakumullah khairan. I, I, I get interested when you mentioned uh, economics based on mercy. And of course, uh, this is very much needed today, whereby in this world, economics is based on capitalism, whereby there is no mercy. The rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer. Uh, all right, alhamdulillah. Um, I would like to remind our participants, our uh, observers uh, and audiences out there to write down your questions in the chat box so that we can address them after this. And now uh, we would like to go to our last panelist, but certainly not the least, uh, Professor Dr. Walid Fekri Faris. Prof. Walid is a professor in mechanical engineering in Kulia of Engineering, IIUM. He is an active researcher and has published more than 200 papers in scientific journals, conference papers, and six textbooks and monographs in his discipline. He's also an active researcher in higher education policies and strategies in the Muslim world, civilizational studies on history of Islamic reform, spirituality and contributions of Muslims in science and technology, for which he has also, uh, he is a published uh, author, both in Arabic and English. He is currently uh, Deputy Dean of ISTAC, IIUM. His address today will focus on relevantizing Islamic spirituality in the wake of the fourth and fifth industrial revolutions for practical purposes and practical approach. Welcome, Prof. Walid. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jenna. Um, uh, I think, uh, I hope everybody can see my presentation, it's clear. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the, the topic that was given to me quite it was uh, quite challenging, in fact, because <laughs> putting Islamic spirituality for uh, uh, Industrial Revolution 4 and 5 uh, needed me to uh, make some uh, research before I, I do this type of, uh, of presentation. But uh, let's uh, start with it. Uh, a few definitions so everybody can understand what we are talking about when you talk about Industrial Revolution. Uh, the people in manufacturing, people in technology, they divide 
the industrial revolutions into five stages, into five stages. The first stage is the industrial revolution, which was known in early Renaissance and um, uh, sorry, in late Renaissance. Uh, which is 1760, around 1760. And this time, the machine started to replace human being in many of the uh, manufacturing activities. And then in uh, 18, 1850, uh, we had what is called, or what people call, technological revolution. Technological revolution in the sense that uh, we are having technology, not only machine, but systems, systems. Uh, replacing many of the manufacturing uh, uh, chains and other things. And this made uh, a big jump to uh, humanity. Uh, industrial revolution number three was what is known, uh, which has uh, been lasted until very recently, known as digital revolution. Digital revolution, the introduction of computers and uh, electronics and what all of these type of things that uh, changed our life drastically, as we can see now. Then in 2011, or uh, around this time, maybe a, a bit before some people, before this, some people around this time, people start to talk about industrial revolution number four. And uh, the industrial revolution number four is actually um, uh, characterized by the widespread of use of cyber physical system. So for the first time, we have uh, not only physical system in manufacturing and production, other things, but we have also cyber system. So we have, uh, you can do uh, things um, on computer and then it will be connected to be produced immediately, to be produced immediately. And we're still in this wave, actually, we're still in this wave. But at the same time, a um, couple of years back, uh, or less than a couple of years back, people start to uh, uh, toy with the idea of industrial revolution number five. Uh, and in this, people are talking about the reconciliation between uh, uh, human beings and machine. Because, of course, machines up till now is taking over. Uh, up to the industrial revolution number four, machines are taking over. And then, so people have started to see that there should be a kind of a, a reconciliation between human beings and machines. Otherwise, we will be like uh, most of the science fiction uh, uh, movies, uh, robots will take over the world, which some people are talking about it now. Um, the industrial revolutions definitely has a lot of uh, important impact on human beings. Nobody can disagree on this. But in the same time, it marked a lot of other uh, side effects that we need to look at. Uh, there is a very interesting paper published in 2018 by a group of uh, uh, Korean scientists. Uh, actually, a, a lot of them, I think they are about maybe eight people together, wrote a very interesting article about the fourth industrial revolution. And in this article, they pointed out to two, uh, to many important points, but the, the two points that I want to bring to this discussion today when they start to link the industrial revolutions to the uh, uh, Maslow uh, pyramid of needs. <clears throat> so according to them, according to them, according to their research is the first and the second revolution, industrial revolution were, were addressing the physical needs, the physical needs of human beings, which is true. Uh, it was addressing, uh, you need to have your uh, food, you need to have your uh, whatever services you have uh, in a quick way, not taking very, very long until you uh, reach to this level. And then after this, the third industrial revolution, in fact, and the end of the second industrial revolution, people start to think about safety, safety. Because of course, when the first and second industrial revolution started, uh, we start to have a lot of uh, uh, safety problems and many people died in fact in this time. So safety became important. And then after this, people start to talk about the social impact. And uh, in the wave of the fourth industrial revolution, now we are talking about self-actualization. Self-actualization in the sense that now people have start to look at themselves more focused than before. And that's why we have all this discussion about uh, the millennial generation and uh, the, um, um, the, the issue of the uh, selfishness and egoistic. But in fact, they are forms of uh, self-actualizations. People start to focus on the individual rather to focus on the society. At the same time, also, they have another 
point in their research, which is also very, very interesting, and that the fourth industrial revolution with the artificial intelligence coming in, now we start to have extension. They brought the idea of extension. So we have extension for us. We have, we have extended human being, extended human being that we start to look into uh, other things. We are not only what we do, but also what we uh, have on, uh, on social media, what we have on other types of things. So this is an extension of the human being. It's an extension of the human being. At the same time, also have extension in space. We have an extension in space. Now you can sit in an, a small room and you can run many things. Even you can go by virtual reality uh, touring the world. So now this is an extension of space, extension of, uh, of land. And uh, they talk about extension of heaven, according to their concept. Uh, extension of heaven is actually all this data, all these uh, uh, clouds and everything. We have huge uh, data and huge information stored. This idea of extension, this idea of extension is very challenging uh, for people who have uh, values and concept because it will start to shake some of the values that we used to know. Uh, values that we used to know like, uh, okay, what is, what is the interpretation of this extension of space, extension of the human being and what, what all of this is about. Um, so this is, uh, though it's good, definitely it's beneficial, but at the same time, it will pose challenges, it will pose challenges. Uh, sorry. Ah, okay. Um, at the same time, also, there have been a lot of discussion on the challenges that are faced in the modern world based on these uh, revolutions happening. So we start to look into the sustainable development issue that uh, we are addressing here at, um, and addressing the university. Uh, clean water, global ethics, uh, energy, science and technology, uh, transnational organized crime, and uh, peace and conflict, the status of women, health issues. We are having many, many things, in fact. And uh, on, this, um, on this group, uh, Millennium uh, Project, uh, or people are updating this every uh, few months based on the research and based on that. So uh, basically, the world is growing, extended, but at the same time, facing many challenges, facing many challenges. Okay, where, where does spirituality come in? Uh, before we come to the spirituality, the idea of education is very fundamental to face these challenges. And the idea of humanizing education has been uh, um, addressed actually since some time. As, as it's not new, in fact, it has been there for a while. But we want to differentiate between two mainstream and this type of thing. One stream is the Islamic stream. Islamic stream, uh, and from the Islamic view, uh, point of view, Islam is a humanizing process, in fact. Islam itself is a humanizing process. Why? Because it brings balance, balance to the human being, balance between material and spirit, balance between uh, society and individual, uh, balance between uh, private, privacy and also open, uh, openness. So Islam itself bringing this type of things. Unfortunately, many of uh, our institutions have not made a lot of progress in this, uh, in this direction. I, I'm referring here to the uh, Muslim institutions, Muslim world institutions have not been. So this is why we start to look into uh, other things. At the same time, the concept of humanization also is an old in the Western perspective, in the Western philosophy. There is um, a humanizing philosophy and other things. And, uh, but in the Western perspective, it has different views. It has different views. Uh, in the Western perspective, it moves from God as a center to human being as a center. From God as a center to human being as a center. What we are addressing in, uh, in IOM, of course, we are addressing the Islamic uh, point of view, uh, which is what I can summarize it simply going to the balance, going to the balance, going to the balance between spirit and form going to the balance between material and spirituality, going to the balance between privacy and uh, openness, and all of these type of balances that Islam brought in. And we should reintroduce this as a concept, in fact, and uh, uh, repackage it uh, to people to look into. Okay, uh, spirituality. Spirituality also has been a buzzword for a while in the West. It has been an integral part of Islam, as mentioned by all our colleagues before, uh, Dr. Wan Azam, uh, Professor Suleiman, uh, Dr. Hamidun. 
this is actually no doubt on this. Yani nobody can dispute this idea that spirituality is an integral part of Islam. You call it whatever you want to call it, but it is an integral part of Islam. But for the modern world, it has been a buzzword for almost about maybe 30 years or more uh, uh, recently. Why? Because the depletion of the spirituality, depletion of, uh, of values have brought the necessity to bring back the balance to the human being again. Uh, the material world uh, prove, proven to have a lot of uh, very bad side effects. We talk about um, uh, international corruption. We talk about uh, uh, people who are not tr trustworthy, uh, big people who are in, in big positions and big, big places. They are not trust trustworthy with their uh, uh, what have been trusted with. Uh, we talk about family collapse. We talk about uh, marriage collapse. We talk about many, many, many issues happening. And all of this because of the pressure of the uh, modern world, the acceleration that has been brought in by the industrial revolution. This is very pressing on the human being and many other things and the issue of material, uh, issue of material life. So um, many people have different uh, uh, definition for spirituality. I, I don't care much about the different uh, definition, but this is one of, the, of them, which is, uh, seems to be quite nice. Uh, spirituality is a quest for self-existent order and harmonious perfection. This is what we are seeking. This is what the natural human being is seeking. We are looking for order and we are looking for harmony. Human being is created to go back to the balance. So the balance for us means order and harmony, as simple as this. And spirituality is the one that will bring us to this stage. Uh, the challenge that I mentioned here is uh, uh, the task world and these type of things uh, led to the fluidity in most of the values. This is another very dangerous issue that is taking place now. Many of the traditional values have becoming fluid. And uh, many people talk about this issue. Now, there is, a, of course, a well-known uh, Polish uh, scholar, uh, uh, Raman Zygmunt. He, he wrote a few books on the fluidity of ethics, fluidity of uh, world, fluidity of the society, all the series of his books about this issue. Uh, he wrote it some time ago, a long time back. And uh, so this fluidity of values, so whatever we used to consider as a dear value to us now, we are questioning it, whether this is right or wrong. So the time, the, the, the time we start to question very normative and universal values, then we know that we are going to a very dangerous zone because at the end of the day, the land under our feet will be shaking because there's no values anymore. <laughs> Everything is, uh, there's no values anymore. Uh, it, it is fluid. It is uh, um, up to interpretation, up to different interpretation. Um, uh, so basically, industrial revolution, with all the benefits that brought in, uh, they brought in the same time a sad effect, which is chaos to the value system, unfortunately. They brought chaos to the value system, which is the very crucial part. And this is where spirituality comes in. Um, as I mentioned, spirituality, you call it spirituality, you call it Sufism, you call it whatever you call it, you call it Tazkiyah. I will not stop at the terminology because sometimes we are actually losing our efforts in disputing terminology, but we are not focusing on the subject matter. So we need to look at the subject matter. You call it whatever you would like to call. You call it whatever is uh, make you comfortable. <laughs> uh, for me, all these terms are Islamic terms. In fact, uh, Sufism is an Islamic term, Tazkiyah is an Islamic term, and all this. So it's, it's no issue here. So we agree that it's part of Islam. I, I will not discuss this issue. This has been discussed. And the other thing also in the spirituality of Sufism and Islam is it's a self-development and awakening path. Uh, this is the most important part. Why we are doing this? Yes, we want to be cl close to Allah, yes. But the, on the way to be, to be close to Allah, you have to develop and you have to get awakening. If you don't have awakening, um, you, you don't understand your limitation, you don't understand your mistakes, your shortcomings. And this is why uh, Ibn Qayyim, in, in his great book, uh, Madarij al Salikin, uh, when he was explaining uh, the stations, stations of the Sufi path, he started by the first station is awakening. So, awakening is very important. Awakening, so, we need to have awakening on the individual level and we need to have awakening on the society level. If we don't have this, I don't think we can move anymore, okay? 
I classify uh, Sufism into three main categories. In fact, um, I think maybe uh, Professor Suleiman or other colleagues can correct me, but uh, this is um, yeah, my own classification. So I classify it as practical Sufism, which is uh, now in the modern terms of spirituality can be interpreted as applied spirituality, applied spirituality. And the great master of this was Imam Ghazali. Abu Hamid Ghazali is a great master of this. Uh, and I'll explain what is applied spirituality is. And then there is a philosophical Sufism or philosophical spirituality, which many people have been talking about, Ibn Arabi, Suhrawardi, and other people. And this is a different level. This is more intellectual. Um, of course, it's useful. It has a lot of uh, value, but it's not really touching the society uh, directly. It's not touching the society. Um, Prof. Walid, five yeah. minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, and then we have festive uh, Sufism. Festive Sufism is Sufism by having festivals. You have nasheed or people go to have zikr and they would be very nice, feeling very well. But actually, this is not deep. This is not deep. Uh, so for applied Islamic spirituality, we have few levels that we need to look into it. According, I'm summarizing actually most of the uh, quote-unquote tariqa uh, or other people or what is mentioned by Al-Ghazali. There are steps very clear in Islamic, applied Islamic spirituality. Number one, uh, faith, iman. You have to establish iman. You have to establish iman. Without iman, you, you, don't, you, you don't have spirituality. According to Islam, without iman, you don't have spirituality. And then number two, rituals. Rituals in the sense you have to do the five pillars. You have to do the uh, uh, salam and siyam and other things. Why? Because according to Islam, these rituals are tools to enhance your spirituality are tools to enhance your spirituality. And we know this from the Quran, in the Quran, we know this also about Siyam and other things, so I, I will not get into this one. And then number three is the commitment to values. Commitment to values is what is used to be known in the Sufi tradition, and even in the during the Prophet time tradition, bayah, pledge. People have pledge on what? People have pledge not on belief, they have pledge on values. Don't cheat. Don't kill. Don't uh, uh, don't take partners to Allah. Uh, respect your uh, husband. All of these type of things uh, with different pledges having. They are pledges on values, actually. And this is the most important part. The pledge or the bay'ah is a value commitment. In the modern term, is a value commitment. So we have to have clear values, and these values, we have to commit ourselves to these values. After this, we have some enhancement, enhancement to this spirituality process. And this will come with the seclusion time. You call it atikar, you call it khulwa, you call it seclusion, you call it whatever you want to call it. But this has been part of Islam since the beginning of Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu established atikar in Ramadan, so we should have a kind of a seclusion time, even once a year even uh, half time. So you should have this one. Why? Because this is the time you can reflect, you can make the fakr, as Professor Suleiman mentioned. And this seclusion should not be idle. Uh, when you have this seclusion, you should not be just, uh, your, your brain is uh, going back and forth. Uh, no, you should have enhancement by remembrance of Allah, dhikr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. According to the Sufi tradition, if we have this, faith, ritual, commitment to values, which is a pledge or the bayah, and then seclusion, then there will be a transforming phase. You'll be transformed. You'll be transformed. So you are going to the second level. Be being a person who have awakening. Being a person to have awakening. If you are doing all the previous and you don't have the awakening, there is something wrong with whatever you're doing. Or is something wrong with you? Because you cannot see your problems. You cannot see your problem. You cannot see your way. So once you have the awakening, then the, after this, you uh, seeing the world and the self differently. You start to see the world around you and yourself in a different way, in the right way, in fact, in the right way. Uh, after this, the Sufi tradition will go for personal experience phase, which we are not really interested in it now. It's more a personal experience that will differ from a person to another person. And this cannot be uh, uh, scientifically measured. It's a kind of a personal experience, nobody can measure. So what is important for us is up to the seventh level. What is important for us is up to the seventh level, that you are a transformed person and you start to see the world and yourself in a different way, in the right way, 
in the right way. Then we have a, 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 a true human being, a true human being. Um, this last one, uh, uh, Dr. Jannah, uh, why this applied spirituality is important, why it is important. Number one, anchoring the human being in the solid ground of universal values. As I mentioned, we have a fluidity in everything. So how can I hang on to something that I should hang on to? I cannot be floating all the way. Uh, so uh, I, should, I should hold for something, hold something. And I hold these values, the values that has been coming with all uh, religions before. Uh, the Ten Commandments and, and Christianity and Judaism, it is also in Islam. It is also in Buddhism. So it's a kind of universal values, in fact, traditional universal values. So I need to hold to this. I need to anchor myself in it. So I know what is right and what's wrong. Otherwise, everything will be mixed up. Number two, helping the human being to balance life between material and spiritual needs. So coming back to the balance between the form and the spirit, the material and the spirituality. So coming to the balance of the human being. And this will keep us our internal balance. Now we start to have very uh, uh, strange phenomena in most of the, uh, of course, it has been in the West for a while, but in the Muslim world, we have been start to see it. People committing suicide under pressure, uh, whatever kind of pressure people or people will go um, uh, nuts um, due to the pressure. Why is this? Because they are knocked off their balance. Literally, they are knocked off their balance, either by the society or by sometimes their own actions, their own actions. So we start to have a lot of, uh, crimes, which is very strange to the uh, traditional Muslim society. So we need to bring this balance again. And then also we need to anchor our human activities in the eco-cosmic system. We need to come again a part of the cosmic system. Uh, Dato Hamidun was referring to the idea that even what people uh, claim to be solids that has no life, like uh, wood, like stones, in the Islamic concept, it has life. We have this. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the Quran, and so everything is actually praising Allah, but we don't understand that. Terms. So this is what we call the eco-cosmic system, that we need to come back to it again. Uh, then we can appreciate the environment. Sustainability will be an immediate outcome. We don't need to think about it. It will be an immediate outcome if I have this mindset. So we need to come back to this mindset. And this mindset needs some work, preparation. And then finally, helping develop the individual and the society hand in hand, because we need to bring back also again the balance between individuality and the society. Uh, some some uh, societies now, individuality is taking over the society. And some other societies, society is taking over the individual, the, the individual. And Islam actually doesn't agree on both ways. It agree on, we need to develop both. And each one of them has his own or its own domain without a conflict. So we need to come back to this balancing. So this is why I think this um, applied spirituality is very important to the individual, to the society, how it can be transformed into a, a curriculum or a education, now this is a different story that we need to, uh, but we do have the basic material that we can do this. Thank you very much for your uh, listening. I'm sorry for taking uh, time. Thank you very, very much, uh, Prof Walid. Uh, when uh, and um, uh, an applied scientist and engineer speaks, things are, you know, uh, methodo methodical. Uh, so thank you very much for that methodical uh, presentation. Uh, applied Sufism, very, very important. Uh, I would like to call upon our special guest, Prof. Suleiman, to comment on this. Well, uh, thank you very much, Brother Walid. It's really very interesting, you know, uh, presentation. And uh, you really summarize Sufism in a very modern terminology, like self-development, self-awareness, and you know balance. This reminded me the holy verse in the Quran, the chapter uh, Rahman. It says, Allah says in the holy Quran, I put the balance, don't destroy it. Now we suffer because we destroy the balance of the uh, environment. We destroy the uh, psychology of uh, you know uh, human beings. And we have so much material from our, uh, you know, Islamic tradition, including Sufism, Islamic philosophy, Islamic art, and everything. We can be really a mercy to all humanity, not just for Muslims. All these ideas, all these beautiful, you know, uh, techniques from Islamic uh, past can be a mercy for the whole world. Because as you know, 
Today, there is a suicide rate in rich Western countries more than the poor countries in Africa. The highest suicide rate is like in Sweden, in Norway, in France, in Germany, in uh, America, because they lost the balance. They think everything is material goods. They think everything is material pleasures. They test it, but still they are unhappy because they, uh, you know, it's like you have a dog, just give the dog uh, not meat, but some, you know, vegetables because you don't know the nature of man. In Islam, Alhamdulillah, we know that um, our nature is both flesh, body, as well as the soul. So we should give the uh, both nourishment. And from Brother Velitz, uh, this uh, beautiful presentation, now we have, uh, mashallah, a lot of uh, able scholars who can uh, humanize our uh, spirituality and uh, for the Western world. Inshallah, all together, I believe, uh, all these scholars from different uh, fields, you know, we can uh, make Islam, uh, make Sufism uh, very relevant, not fully. Unfortunately, Alhamdulillah, we are so lucky today because the world is in a, uh, as you, as Brother Valid said, fluid, you know, all these uh, values became fluid. You believe something today, the church said in the past, marriage is sacred, then they, they, you can, they, they say today, marriage is not needed. You can even marry the same sex marriage, you know. There are no values anymore. Every, any, everything they are discussing today in the West is very sad. But in Islam, we have, alhamdulillah, unchangeable truths. No one discuss it, which is very good for us. So we have an anchor in the you know uh, metaphysics. So I believe, uh, Brother Walid, uh, we will be a mercy to all humanity, inshallah, all together. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you very much, Prof. Suleiman. Um... I think, um, and thank you very much, Prof. Walid. Thank you very much, all uh, presenters. I think it is time for us to look into the questions. So I am going to look into the questions right now from the chat box. We have, at the moment, five questions. Uh, let's see, where is the first question? Um, I think this is the first question from Radzi Sapi'i. I think so. Uh, Razi Sapi, a uh, question for Prof. Walid. Since you mentioned about self-actualization and IR5 in which technology becomes more interfaced with human, since this webinar covers Sufism and its relevance to the modern world, do you foresee future technological means that could provide some way of experiencing Gnosis? I mean, in traditional way, you have to practice certain sets, certain sets of prescribed dhikr, for, for example, in place of khalwat under the supervision of a murshid to gain, uh, to gain that outworld experience with which could be said to happen under an altered state of mind. So is this possible that a new technology can perhaps incorporate immersive virtual reality experience could pave the way for a genuine gnosis with God. Prof. Uh, Wali. Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting question, Professor Razi. And of course, uh, it's very challenging because we are looking at the future. A massive virtual reality definitely can do some good, definitely can do some good. But at the same time, also, it can do some damage because, number one, it will make us very self absorbed very self-absorbed and in, in even in the spiritual practices of uh, Muslims, the Sufi practices, you have to balance between being self-absorbed and also uh, the issue of the service, the khidmah that mentioned uh, before. Uh, so um, the, the, the problem with the uh, immersive virtual reality, it can make the person withdraw from the society and it can make the person live with himself or herself only without need to other connections. But at the same time, it can be helpful if you want to have a kind of a seclusion time, if you want to have a kind of a, a, a spare time for yourself and uh, to look into your relation with God, to look into your relation with yourself, with the society around you. Because the, uh, the concept of Khalwa in Islam is more uh, uh, a kind of a cognitive effort is a cognitive effort is an effort that you do and you try to think about your position towards God your position towards the society 
and also your position towards yourself. So yes, it can help, and uh, it might also harm. It depends on how it should be used, but definitely it will have an influence. Definitely it will have an influence, and people talk about uh, the alter uh, self and other things now uh, becoming very common. So, and also it is a bit sometimes dangerous I, because there's no time to get into this. There's a lot of dangerous zones here, so it need to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, under a bit of a guidance of supervision, otherwise people will, uh, uh, and this is why, for example, the tariqa will have the uh, sheikh or the ustaz guide you, and some people, sometimes they will get them out of their seclusion. Why? Because if they feel the murid or the student is facing some uh, problematic issues, uh, so this needs uh, supervision, it needs supervision, but definitely to be helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ali. Second question from Sister Rumaiza Abu Bakar. Salam, I have a question. How do we reconcile and narrow the gap between Sufism and Salafism? How could the two movements coexist peacefully? Uh, Dr. Hamidun, your take on this, please. Are you, uh, you muted, Dato? No, I'm okay. okay now. Okay, alhamdulillah. Right. My take on this from the background of reading, uh, what do you call it? Amil al Nihal Hisharashtani, Farq Ben al Firaq, and also Tariq Mazahib, the Imam Abu Zahra, that uh, it goes back to, you know, I would say, what do we want? The two of them, what do you want? If you're looking at your brother in this type of uh, judgmental sort of thing, then that's it. Nah. Then you will never come back together. But if you're looking at it as these are still your brothers and your heart yeah. has got to be joined because these are brothers and you'll be standing in front of Allah later on as brothers. So this is what I'm saying. So looking at the different mazahib that we have and usually we find that it comes about because of the murid doesn't agree with the sheikh, for example, or not from the same uh, affiliation to another leader and so on and so forth. So in the end, it goes back just to the ego, I would say. So how can we reconcile? We have to go back to each one as brothers and sit down. Simple as that. Thank you very much. And the heart of the problem, <laughs> the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Yep. <laughs> it comes back to the heart, mashallah. Okay, let's see. Something. Uh, Yes, yes, please, Prof. Uh, Suleiman. Yes, we have so many scholars that all uh, Salafis and Sufis love, like uh, Ibn Qayyim al jawziya like Ibn Taymiyyah, <laughs> like, uh, you know, uh, Abdul Qadir Jailani, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jailani, they are all accepted, Imam Ghazali, accepted by Sufis and Salafis. Mm -hmm. So let's start with these uh, people that we uh, love and care from their books, also from our tradition, Mm. We have so many scholars, also Sufis. I think we can reach a kind of balance, as Brother Walid mm. said. We can have a balanced, you know, uh, relationship with these Salafi brothers and sisters. They're all brothers and sisters, you know. In Islam, uh, you know, this is, we, we sometimes we forget it. Mm. And we all, always talk about, uh, you know, uh, theoretical issues, you know. Mm. Always on uh, theological issues. We forget helping each other, feeding each other, you know. Uh, so now we have Kurbani coming close. Mm. We should send uh, Kurbanis to Africa, you know. Right. We should show all love to people, not right. all the other right. Right. Oh, right. you are not celebrating, you are bad, and you know. Right. Yeah. So we should, inshallah, uh, also open uh, space for humanitarian help among Islamic countries, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Suleiman. Uh, there's one comment here. It's not a question, but a comment. I'll read it anyways. Um, I am hoping to participate in this discussions or circle for more specific topics of humanizing education. I applaud your efforts and I am positive that this effort will continue Amin. until we can have tangible results, inshallah. Amin. Amin. Um, all right, there's another message here, uh, but I cannot read it. Let me see. Mm. Well, I don't, I cannot access that message. Um, 
now perhaps I can open to any participants who would like to uh, ask um, live uh, for the panels to panel members to answer. Anyone would like to uh, post questions live? If not, then perhaps uh, I can ask one question here. Um, we were talking about um, just now. Hold on, yeah. Mm, a balance between self and society. Uh, when we talk about uh, Prof. Walid answering the question on, uh, you know, uh, technology uh, that can help in the. Uh, immersion of virtual reality uh, that can pave way into Nasir's experience. So Prof. Walid says balance between self and society, but the danger of extreme self-absorption. Uh, can we extend this a little bit into the current uh, scenario of the society today, whereby uh, depression uh, is quite predominant? Uh, your take on this uh, in terms of spirituality and how do we address um, uh, depression at this uh, day and age, whereby uh, a lot of things are being, uh, you know, um, a lot of technology comes into place, a lot of social media, and at the same time, we have a lot of depression as well. Uh, Prof. Walid, can you extend on that, please? Um, this is also a very interesting uh, question. Uh, depression is becoming a kind of a modern world uh, illness. Many people talk about the different levels of depression, whether it's um, a light one or severe cases or anything like this. And to, to try to address this issue, we need to understand what is the source of depression? What is the source of depression? One of the main sources of depression, according to a psychologist, is basically a, a pessimistic view, a pessimistic view or anxiety uh, that you are um, afraid, you fear something to happen you feel something to happen, or you feel that nothing will improve, nothing will, will get right. So we start to go into this depression phase. I always say that the greatest thing about Iman, about faith, is it gives us hope. It gives us hope. And this is a key issue. Without Iman, there's no hope, basically, because we believe even if we don't, even the person, if he will do or she will do her best, and they are not rewarded in this world, they will be rewarded in the hereafter. This concept of itself is very fundamental to our psychological balance. Um, of course, there's some other things also to have to be very scientific. There are some other uh, problems related to depression based on uh, inheritance and some uh, uh, chemical disorder in, in the brain. In this case, this needs to be addressed uh, scientifically. This needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, to cure the depression mode that goes along many places, we have to promote hope. We have to get um, a freedom zone for people. And this is, this is where spirituality play a key role. Spirituality will give a freedom zone to me to, to talk to Allah, to express myself to him, to try to explore myself. So if we try to encourage people to have all of this, then there, there will be a lot of uh, I, I, I would say there will be a lot of reduction in the depression uh, illnesses that we are seeing here and there. Allah. Thank you very much, Prof. Walid. Uh, Dr. Wan Azam, uh, could you please um, you know, shed some more light in this? Because Prof. Walid mentioned about faith, which gives us hope. And without faith, without Iman, there is no hope. And we have to promote both, which is the freedom zone for people through spirituality. However, in the contemporary uh, way in addressing uh, depression, for example, which is related to um, you know, IR four and five, um, people always say, don't tell me that I don't have Iman. Don't tell me that my spirituality is not good. Uh, don't tell me that because I am not a prophet and things like that, I, you know, uh, I would be more uh, more suffering from depression. So, your take on this, uh, Doctor Wan Azam? How can we reconcile for people who say that uh, when you know depression doesn't have anything to do with the level of spirituality or iman? Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> 
Dr. Uh, Prof. Walid has uh, listed down the the what the faith, the ritual, and so on. And I I think this is very much relevant to to the modern to the modern world because uh, I also uh, listed down some of the tariqa uh, disciplines uh, like. Um, um, by uh, also Prof. Walid also talk about this, but uh, Prof. Walid uh, interpretation is much more relevant to the modern. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, awakening under the interpretation of Dr. Walid, uh, Prof. Walid, I think is relevant to this uh, awakening, meaning that uh, if we go to back to the Aljunet. Uh, Sheikh Al Junaid, he also stressed on awakening, but his awakening is that uh, to uh, awake uh, from uh, Khalwa uh, ilallah, and then uh, we come back to the society. So this is the place where I think uh, the real uh, the real awakening, uh, just as uh, Prof Walid mentioned just now, it is very much relevant. Uh, before this, I. I was thinking as an uh, IRK person, IRK students, uh, how to make it relevant to the modern. Say, for instance, the awakening, uh, sohwa, uh, the bay'ah, uh, the uh, faith, uh, how, how to make it relevant. And these are the things that uh, I think are needed or required uh, in, in uh, approach the the uh, current uh, problem, the depressed, uh, depressed people, uh, because they are Muslims, but uh, they do not uh, do not know uh, they are depressed, and we also, as a religious people, uh, do not know what to do with these people. And I think uh, Prof. Walid uh, uh, explanation, I think, uh, very relevant to this, to these, um, uh, to these issues. Uh? Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, uh, in another times, I think we need more discussion like like this. Eh? Prof, thank you very much for for your explanation. Before this, when I list down the the characteristic of the tariqa, uh, I just stuck there. How how to apply the bayah? How to apply the bayah? Uh, the 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 sahwa, uh, and so on so forth. So by by. Looking at your explanation, just a little bit, I can relate now. <laughs> so I think this is the place where, where it's, uh, it's very relevant, the, the spirituality uh, mentioned or explained by, by Prof. Walid. So I think th that is my, my response and my answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, mm. Dr. Wan Azam. Mm. Uh, applied Sufism according to Prof. Walid, anchoring human to solid ground of universal values, helping men for a balanced life of material and spiritual, keeping the internal balance, anchoring human activities in the eco-cosmic uh, eco mm. system, uh, and helping develop balance between the individual and society um, hand in hand. Uh, Prof, uh, Dr. Hamidun, Dr. Hamidun, please uh, comment on this, please. That's, that's very wide. <laughs> I think it's not what it means, but back to the, the thing just now and back to the question about uh, the, the brother Razi. Eh? This is the point that, that, that we're making, that uh, the scientific developments, uh, we cannot be away from it because we are the one we're supposed to be Ummatan Wasata and bring our uh, alternative, bring our uh, formula in order to we still become uh, we, we are still human inside, in sun, and still accepting the, uh, the khilafah, uh, the, what they call it, responsibility, and still being uh, the created uh, slave of the creator, even though, as the Quran said, uh, mm -hmm. even if they come to 1,000 years of age, Right, but it will still not be able to prevent him from getting to hellfire if he is not of the obedient type or he is kufu, right? And and also, 
you know, ayats mentioning like uh, ya ya ma'asyara insi wal ji in istata'tu an tanfuzu an min aqtari samawati wal uh, wal ard fanfuzu making the tanfiz the jumping with great energy great power from one corner of the universe to another corner of the universe samawat and now they say it's multiverse as the quran has said jumping from one place to other place do it if you are able to do it you will not be able to do it except with sultan right so what i mean to say is that the ayah has opened us vistas of future development as far as i understand in science and so on but that control of this capability that we can fly from one place to another to another does that make us the creator this is the point so we are the one who should be bringing this to them now and you're mentioning about the iman thing yes but then please understand that iman is not just deep so most of us sometimes you know i've said i i'm a muslim so then i'm okay right but where is your relation to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala matters of the heart is there allah inside of you when you are buying your 300 dollar 400 dollar uh, baju kurung and so on and so forth because jenama or is it you know this is beautiful i like it i like it but does allah like it or would allah like it better forget about that 400 I'll just buy 100 and the other 300 I'll buy another sizes to give to those cleaners who don't have the money to buy who don't even think of it. so this is the point right so where is that iman that, that sort of iman so if we can instill in them or in every one of us that iman which is closer to our uh, extraterrestrial nature which is the roh we are from jannah from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we are close there close to that nature then inshallah we will be going up to the ladders of uh, spirituality to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, <coughs> that, you know, that, that we are between, always with that imam, we know we are between khawf, we are between fear that we'll have problem, we will fail, we will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that raja, that hope that Allah will accept everything, uh, even our our, our weaknesses, Allah will have that mercy. He is our Rahman. And we have that hope of our Rahman for his mercy to accept us. So I think with that sort of Iman, inshallah, we can solve a lot of things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamidun. Professor Suleiman, your last words? Actually, uh, when we look at the Holy Quran, uh, Iman is okay. Iman will save us in hereafter. Even a very bad Muslim will go to paradise after some punishment, Mr. Yeah. Hamidun. But in this life, okay. yeah. we should believe as well as we should do good things, you know. If you're a Muslim, man, you are doing good, bad things. You are smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, and you are saying, I trust Allah. I have a call to Allah. Allah will protect me. Allah will protect you, you know, if you don't protect yourself. If you do bad things, you will suffer the results of it. Yeah. So also about this, uh, I would like to add to Brother Berit's uh, explanation. If we, if we want to avoid all these uh, psychological illnesses, depression, Allah says the Holy Quran, The hearts will be happy with, uh, you know, remembering of Allah, with uh, feeling or closeness to Allah, then we will not suffer this depression and other things. We will have tumu'naniya in our heart, inshallah. Yeah, sure. And of course, we should do, uh, as the last thing I would like to say, Technology is sometimes bad for spirituality. Technology is good for material things. Pushing machines, you know, all these uh, cars and everything is good. But when it comes to spirituality, it is very dangerous. We need uh, a sheikh, a master to control it. Otherwise, once you enter this meta world and all this, uh, you know, internet world, it is very difficult to come back safe and sound. So we should use technology and spirituality very carefully under the guidance of some masters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Suleiman. Prof. Walid, your last word. Um, actually, uh, I said whatever I want to say, but uh, I would stress that we need to um, have maybe uh, more discussion on uh, the uh, putting uh, Sufism and spirituality of Tazkiyah, whatever you people want to call it, into a more modern terms so people can understand. This, we need a lot of effort for this. We have a great heritage. I always say we have a great heritage, an excellent one, that we can uh, yeah, reintroduce it to the world 
and it will be very useful. But it needs some work. It needs some work. We need to work on it. Uh, so maybe we can have more uh, specific discussion. Maybe Professor Suleiman in Turkey also. I know they have some conferences on Sufism, but we need to look into how to put this into the modern needs. Uh, as he mentioned, <laughs> nobody will be uh, willing to stay a murid for 30 years until he will reach a certain level. Not anymore. Very few people will accept this now. Uh, so we need to have a kind of a, um, a quick fix to these issues uh, based on this heritage. Wallahu Thank you very much, Prof. Ali. Uh, Dr. Wan Azam, your last word. Um, I, 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 I think... Um, uh, much discussion on on this, eh? especially the how to integrate, how to relevantize the Islamic spirituality eh? uh, into the modern world. Eh? Because uh, the in the past they have already laid down some some doctrine, some uh, framework, but uh, we do not know how to make it relevant. How to integrate eh, with the with the modern world? So I think uh, we need uh, more discussion on this, eh, especially uh, related to the to the science and technology, to the modern world, uh, and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Akmal. Would you like to say something as a closure? No, indeed. Thank you very much to all of our guest speakers. Uh, I have actually learned a lot this this afternoon. Jazakumullah. And uh, certainly open up new perspectives on how to uh, further analyze the whole situation. Although that, you know, the most important take home message for me is the issues and questions that were raised. And also I'm uh, looking at, you know, the possibility of uh, linking the dots and everything. Jazakumullah. Uh, indeed that, of course, as I mentioned uh, to all the audiences and those participating in this program, uh, we are recording this one. And it is, of course, uh, will be referred to in the future if you want some, some other things as well. Uh, I do see some suggestions over there, perhaps that we should be dwelling on some of the issues as well related to this one in the future. Uh, inshallah, it's going to be a series, as I mentioned to you, that it is uh, under the umbrella of this uh, humanizing education. And we'll be looking at uh, into some other topics as well in the future. Uh, with your du'a and prayer, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Thank you very much. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, I would like to uh, also make a request for the panelists to perhaps develop your presentations further, uh, for which we can make them into chapters towards a book. Uh, inshallah, we will be working on that. Uh, we had uh, the previous series on humanizing education as well. So perhaps we can compile all that into a book, inshallah. Um, also, I would like to ask participants to remain on the screen for a photo shoot. And before we end, I would like to invite Brother Saiful Akmal uh, to read a short du'a to mark the closing of Centris's fifth virtual forum for the year 2021-2022 on humanizing education for Rahmatan Lil Alameen, Islamic spirituality, Sufism, and scientific prolifer glory proliferation. Brother Saiful. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إنا نسألك بأننا نشهد أنك أنت الله لا إله إلا أنت الأحد الأحد الصمت لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سقطك والنار الله ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا أفرق علينا الصبرا وتوفنا مسلمين اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا حما إلا فرجته ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا سقما إلا شفيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا حاجة إلا قضيتها ويسرته فيسر لنا أمورنا واشرح صدورنا ونور قلوبنا واختم بالصالحة أعمالنا ربنا آمنا فاغفر لنا وارحمنا وأنت خير الراحمين 
ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار صلى الله على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين امين يا رب العالمين now i would like to request all of us to show ourselves on the screen uh, brother ikram from the admin could you please uh, capture us all brother shafiullah uh, capture us all as a memento of our forum inshallah please show yourselves everyone then uh, brother ikram please indicate whether it's done yes yeah. all right thank you very very much with that uh, our forum has come to a closure inshallah we take notice of all the comments and inshallah further uh, forums of this kind would uh, come to your screen inshallah and we will uh, announce it let us end with tasbih kafara and surah walas بارك الله فيك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر من الانسان لا الذين امنوا ولا الصالحين وتوسل لهم تاسوس السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمه الله تعالى وبركاته اول شيء في الله عليكم ثانك يو اول ثانك يو فيري فيري ماتش اول اوف يو جزاكم الله خيرا كثيرا ثانك يو فيري ماتش بروف سليمان ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور حميدون Thank you very much, Prof. Akmar and Saiful and Shafiullah and Ikram and Barakullah and whoever else is behind the screen. Thank you very much, Brother Razi. Brother Razi, we have to go for Mangopi, yeah? <laughs> We're discussing that. Okay. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullah.